Bless you. I'm ready when you are. William Case of the State. James Owens on behalf of Sarah Boone. Good morning. Can you please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? 10, 10, 7, 7. Ms. Boone is seated at council table wearing a black suit and a pink blouse. She is in custody in this matter. However, there are no restraints that are affixed to her person. So we will be standing when our jury enters and exits. Before we bring in our jury this morning, yesterday the court had reserved on a Richardson hearing regarding Exhibit 2 is identified in the Defendant's Fifth Amendment Reciprocal Discovery Exhibit List, specifically 119 pages of records from Advent Health Central Park that were provided to the state yesterday morning by way of USB drive. Yesterday, the court had ordered that the defense was to provide an edited version of only the records pertaining to anxiety and the lack thereof, or anything pertaining to those matters, but before 9 a.m. this morning. Was that done, Mr. Owens? Okay. Mr. Jay, have you the opportunity to review the culled down list of 119 documents? Yes. Okay. What is remaining of those 119 specific JPEG images, and what do they pertain to? Of those 119 images, how many are being sought? 15? Okay, thank you. State response. Apparently, these are all just related to January 23rd, 2018, admission at Advent Health Winter Park. So, here's they're not seeking to introduce any records from other instances that were contained in the records that were first disclosed to the state on September 27th. You speak of the 81 pages? Yes, sir. Thank you. Nor the new 119 pictures, um, but still not in a PDF form. Um, so, of the 15 pages, the first two that they list are pages 9 and 10 out of 111, and I believe I've identified them as best I can. However, the bait stamp from the hospital is over other text, and there is no other bait stamp. So I had to, I'm guessing that it's pages 9 and 10 out of 111. Um, it appears to just be a health information sharing sheet, like a contract. I don't understand the relevance of those two pages. Pages 21, and then they skip 22, 23, 24, and 25 are all part of for initial assessment on 123.18. We don't object to those pages, but for, and I apologize that there is but for, um, the fact that at the bottom of page 25 begins her toxicology screening, and that does go into page 26, and they did not indicate that they want to use page 26. However, without page 26, uh, 
we are going to experience relevancy issues in a 403 objection from the state. And that is because in her toxicology screen, for which she is coming to the treatment to seek treatment for depression, depression symptoms, she is at 165 for ethanol, meaning when converted, it's 0.165 grams per deciliter, over twice the legal limit. Um, the central nervous system depressant, and we're going to have at least one medical doctor, or two, a forensic pathologist will testify for the state, and then our expert on battered spouse syndrome, if we get to that point, is also a medical doctor, she's a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. Um, will tell us that ethanol is a central nervous system present. I believe even the psychologist will, will be able to get that information. And so we are objecting to pages 21 through 25 coming in without page 26. If, if I understand your argument, is it a rule of completeness issue? Yeah, I mean, in, in the sense that it applies to documents as opposed to statements. I mean, it is not a court statement, so it is rule of completeness issue, particularly when the symptoms and complaints of the patient on that particular day were crying and being depressed and showing signs of using a central nervous system depressant. Um, the rest of the talk screen, pages 27 and 28, um, they did not list. We are not uh, complaining uh, that they are not including that. Uh, page 29 is another page they listed that's more of a narrative about her visit at uh, January 23rd, 2018. We do not object. Page 43, uh, it's just for vital signs, we don't object. Page 44 is more of the initial assessment on this January 23rd, 2018 visit, we do not object, nor do we object to pages 45, 46, or 47. What are pages 45, 46, and 47, just for my own? More of this initial assessment, uh, January 23rd, 2018, is my understanding. Page 48, um, we are asking again that this be included. Um, again, uh, I don't believe it's super mysterious why we are going from pages 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, and then skipping page 48, and then going to 49, but we do want page 48 included. Uh, on that page includes her height and weight at the time. Um, page 63. What's 49? So seemingly that's in 49 uh, is just some results. Again, it's misleading and doesn't provide full context without what I've described as page 26, because part of the results on page 49 show that she was, you. shows that she was tested for the presence of ethyl alcohol or ethanol, um, but it doesn't give the results. Are the results contained in another page? It's on page 26, the one I previously described as wanting to include. So not following 49 to 50 or 51 sequentially. No, because the pages they want from the 40s are 43 through 47, skipping 48. And we're asking for 48 to be included between 47 and 49 to make sure it's relevant and complete. But they are also seeking 49, correct? Yes. Thank you. Just They, they just skipped 48 just like they skipped 26. Okay. Um, <clears throat> age 63, uh, it appears to be repetitive, but we don't have any particular uh Objection page 63 of the 111. Page 108 seems to be another part of the initial assessment from January 23rd, 2018. So we don't object to that. So basically, we're asking for pages 26 and 48 to be included. Okay, thank you. Um, the defense did, I'm sorry, the state did seek a Richardson uh, hearing yesterday in this matter, and based on finding precedent, the 6th District Court of Appeal, Young v. State, 369, 7, 3rd, 1243. Regardless of the culling down of the records, the court still is required to conduct a Richardson hearing. As to the issue of whether the defendant's violation was inadvertent or willful, Mr. Owens had advised that these documents were um, obtained sometime last week. He was unable to provide any specificity. He's going to confer with his office. Um, Mr. Owens or Mr. Beck, are you in a position to advise when these documents were first requested, when they were received, and when they were sent to the state? Specifically, any documents pertaining to uh, Exhibit 2, the Advent Health Winter Park records. 
I did check with my secretary, Margaret, and my understanding is, I, I, I didn't know that was going to be a question about when we actually sent it out. I know it was. Um, on my trips down here, I got Sarah Boone to sign the medical records and sent it to the hospital with the weeks, I don't say. We got it last week. Uh, we don't know exactly when. We, we don't time stamp at our office when something is mailed in. It's mailed in from the hospital. Um, for whatever reason, uh, the records did not get to Shelby. It was handling that until late yesterday, the day before, that she was aware that they had not been disclosed and provided a uh, copy to the state. So did these records come in batches? Because my understanding, based on the state's representation and their objections, was that the first 81 pages came on September 27th. Those were provided. Those were, separate. those were records that some of the other lawyers, one of the other lawyers had received. And we sent them on, but the problem was they had notes on it. We sent that 81, but it wasn't directly from the hospital. So we were trying to get a more complete, unedited copy of the successful reading copy. Okay, and when was the um, error identified in time as to when these items were not sent, such that they were provided via USB yesterday. Whatever date we gave them is when we realized there was an error. Okay, my understanding that would have been yesterday morning. Okay. Anything else, sir? Any further argument or positions with regard to the Richardson analysis, Mr. J? Is that the 119 pages, sir? Any objection? All right, what was pre-marked A for the purposes of the Richardson hearing will be received without objection as states one. Um, there was just a reference that one pages were all marked up um, by the defense. There's no, there's no markings. Um, the issue and the confusion that the state attorney's office still has, though, is page 68 of 81, of these original 81 documents. If you have a cell phone on, they need to be silenced and turned off, please. If you cannot follow the court's instructions, Due to the publicity in this case, I will ask for you to be removed. Does everyone understand? Thank you. You may proceed. And I, I realize that I've only had a limited amount of time uh, to review the 119 pages that came in yesterday. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's more difficult to review those because it's just, it's not in a PDF where I can word search it and, and do any of the things that are afforded to us with modern technology came in as 119 separate JPEGs. They're not in order. So, for instance, when I, I'm trying to look for page 43 of those 111 records out of 119 pages, it's not in order. Um, and I've done my absolute best to try and see if this page, which is 68. Yes. And referring to 68 of the 81, that was yes, sir. one, correct? Yes, sir. It is sub-labeled within these records is page 2 of 14, and it appears to be a part of her visit on January 23rd, 2018. And in the social history provided, 
Um, it says alcohol use denies, tobacco use denies, um, the other part is irrelevant. And I just haven't been able to find that. And so I'm asking for the leeway um, to continue to try and search for that particular page out of 119 so that I may ask that out of the doctrine of completeness, fairness, uh, that it be included. I'm just at this point, I've not been able to find anything in the records that says that. And I'm limited to my abilities to cheat with technology and put it, you know, if there's a 119 page PDF and you make it word searchable, you just put in the magic word and it helps the, the attorney break. Um, so that's, that's why there, there's this confusion. And that's part of why I, I had to raise this issue was just at my first glance at those pages yesterday, I knew that something seemed off compared to what was previously provided. Okay. Any response? Yes, I did. Your Honor, I'm not familiar with that. That is the document. I was reviewing all the reporting. It's not the Okay. I appreciate y'all working together on that. So here's what we're going to do. Yes. We have told the state that we would bring in a printed copy, not the PDF, uh, this morning. But uh, Federal Express, which is the block away, for whatever reason, the road was being constructed. So they, they closed. So we were there at 8 o'clock to get the copy to the state. We had promised, but we will bring one at lunch to hand the state. Okay, appreciate it. All right. Any other argument with regard to the Richardson issue? Anything further, Mr. Beck? Okay. With regard to, let, let me let me conclude the Richardson analysis first. All right. Thank you both for your positions and your arguments. The court has, um, as a matter of law, the court needs to determine whether the defendant's violation was inadvertent or willful. The court finds that based on uh, the positions provided by the defense that the disclosure was inadvertent. But I do find that the violation had some level of substantiality to it. But due to the uh, state's review and the defense compliance with the court's order yesterday as to culling down to the pages that we've identified, the court finds that the violation had a limited ability on the state's ability to prepare for trial due to the lack of objections to the majority of the documents with the exception of page 48 and 26, which are sought to be included. Uh, for those reasons, I find that the prejudicial effect of the substantial disclosure is limited, uh, and I'm not going to um, order the defense, not going to prohibit the defense from proceeding forward on moving these items into evidence. However, I do want to address the uh, 403 rule of completeness issue with regard to paragraph pages, excuse me, 26 and 49 as, excuse me, 26 and 48 as sought by the state. No objection, Mr. Beck. All right, thank you. So uh, the state's request is granted. Um, uh, pages 26 and 48 will be included um, uh, in any evidentiary documents that sought or sought to be involved, uh, moved into evidence with regard to this January 23 2018 incident is provided in the 119 pages of item two of the defendant's fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list. I will not foreclose the state regarding um, page 68 of the 81 pages. If they are able to find that additional document, we can um, we can address any argument at that time as to why that should be included. Anything further state before we bring in our jury? Judge, uh, defense team has indicated demonstrative aids during opening statement. Um, the ones that I have seen include jury instructions that may not be given and may not be given in the way that the court gives and photographs that could be coming into evidence. I identified at least one that I don't recognize as something they sought to be seeking into evidence, perhaps two. Um, so I believe we should have a discussion about each and every one of those. They should each be marked uh, for record purposes by letter so that we can refer to them and make a record. Um, I believe it's in the court's discretion, even though I rarely see it exercised in this way in this circuit, to allow uh, the respective parties to refer to actual exhibits during opening statements. Um, I would urge the court not to allow that. They're going to see them soon enough, um, but particularly with what they are seeking to do, given the motion to eliminate ruling the court has already issued, that at this point in time, 
the latest proffer of the defendant's testimony is not amounting to an overt act that will result in self-defense instruction, that will result in prior instances of violence coming in, um, that it would be extremely prejudicial, dangerous, and to use Mr. Pachatori's analogy, very impossible to put that toothpaste back in the tube if we amplify our opening statements, which may or may not come to fruition when we start talking about these past instances and battered spouse syndrome, it would be greatly amplified if they're actually seeing exhibits um, of uh, the defendant's past injuries that she's attributing to the student. So I'm asking for us to discuss that. Response before we go through each photo. Judge, um, yeah, defense is self-defense. Sarah's going to testify that she was defending herself. We believe that we were entitled to put on a case involving self-defense. And uh, the instruction for justifiable use of non-deadly force and the justifiable use of deadly force. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not discussing the jury instructions at this time. There are... Here's my concern. Why are we addressing law in opening statement? I agree with the statement. It still it does not answer my question. Okay. No, I can see it, sir. What's your position with regard to those two, Mr. J? Judge, opening statements, we should be discussing what we anticipate coming um, into the trial, and that's going to be enough for my view. Um, really shouldn't be about the law. We'll both have an opportunity to use the actual jury instructions, which we have not decided upon. Um, we will have the opportunity to use that overhead or, or any means that we want at the end of the trial during our closings to put up what is actually decided to be the law after the case has been presented. Um, so our position that we shouldn't be using demonstrative aids or portions of jury instructions we're going to have that opportunity to argue how the law applies to the facts at the end, and we will have the correct version. And if the court um, is following the tendency that I've seen in the circuit recently, we may, in fact, read three quarters of the jury instructions to them before we bring even begin our closing remarks. I think it's premature and problematic to, to be doing that at this time. It's not the, the role of opening remarks. Any other response? During this 35 years at these boards, I've used these boards in opening statements I don't know how many times. I've said that I would waive introducing the one specific to self-defense. But reasonable doubt is the instruction you gave to the jury when we got started. And then this weighing the evidence is a standard jury instruction that applies in everything. Are those the standard? Is that the language of the standard instruction? I have not had the opportunity this morning to pull up Florida Standard Criminal Jury Instructions off the Supreme Court website due to dealing with motions to eliminate, trying to prepare my opening statement, and doing all the things that I should be doing on the openings. Um, I did notice that I did not believe the reasonable doubt instruction was complete just from memory, and I know that's not complete weighing the evidence um, instruction either. It's an entire page of instructions for each. Can I see the reasonable doubt instruction, please? Well, here's the first problem. That's the wrong instruction. Florida Supreme Court revised 3.7 earlier this year. That is not the appropriate definition of reasonable doubt. It is not what was read to the jury during jury selection. 3.7 now reads, proof beyond a reasonable doubt means not being proof beyond all doubt. 
Reasonable doubt is not an impossible, speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or, having the conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. That does not track standard jury instruction. For those reasons, I'm not going to allow it. As long as it, I mean, we're, we're still in the process of working through. The 3.7 instruction speaks for itself. I won't preclude you from using enlargements in closing, but for the purposes of opening, because it doesn't track the 3.7 instruction, I'm not going to allow it. That seems to be the standard 3.9 instructions, or at least portions of it. Response? Again, since it's not all of it, it's misleading, it's, it's highlighting something about the law. When we're just talking about open remarks, opening remarks, 6 through 10 are optional. We haven't decided which out of the optional instructions 6 to 10 we're going to use in this case. Because we have not heard the evidence yet. So I just think it's inappropriate to be delving into pieces and portions of jury instructions before we get the evidence. What we should be doing is explaining to the jury what we believe the facts are going to show and the inferences that they can draw from them uh, and argue the law later. Last bite at the apple, sir. The judge, they, they've got to have some guidance to the law. You know, they, in many ways, we do it where we give them the law at the very end. You know, and I understand the reason for that, depending on the evidence that comes in, but there's standard instructions that are going to apply throughout. And this is just giving them an idea of what their role is considering the credibility of witnesses. I think it's appropriate. It's a brief statement of a standard instruction that comes in on every case. Let me move to the photographs before I address the 3.9 issue. I think records you we should mark them. Okay. Do you want them mark you want them marked by Madam Clerk, correct? Okay. So let's approach with that first photograph, please. Madam Clerk, yes.
Okay. Next photo. Thank you. 
Any other further argument with regard to the use of those items pre-marked as A through I in opening statement, Mr. Owens? When did you send it, sir? I have not received it. The state seen a copy of it? I'm familiar with the case law. I did receive the email. I'm not sure who all copied on it. This is just these two cases. And provided Al Segarra v. State, 326 Southern 3rd, 656, Florida Supreme Court, 2021. Lobby State 259, Southern 3rd 23, for Supreme Court 2018. Yes, sir. Judge, the court has discretion to allow the lawsuit to the aides. If you look at one or both of those, there was a state one introduced a dummy they were using in a homicide case, which the court allowed other other cases that allowed for the graphs. The monster debates to be used in opening statements. In the uh, Alcagir case, which is the 2021 case, Supreme Court 
trial court acted with its discretion in preventing state's use of a map as a demonstrative aid during the guilt phase rebuttal closing argument in the capital murder trial. Evidence visually demonstrated on the map was not without support in the record. That was actually in the record. Two thousand eighteen case, Supreme Court of Florida. Again, the trial court acted within its discretion, you know, allowing a demonstrative exhibit in that case. Uh, it was a murder prosecution. The trial court acted within its discretion in allowing the state to use a mannequin in a demonstrative aid in order to show the shoot the gun in relation to the victim's body. The mannequin was used to set out the circumstances of the crime and to attempt to establish aggravation. The mannequin was used to demonstrate the location of the gunshot wound, the angle of the impact against the skin, the incapacitating nature of each gunshot wound, the sizing of the trajectories were anatomical, not spatial, and had a small degree of error, where only a slight difference between the victim size and the mannequin's dimensions. There's nothing to suggest the mannequin was altered to resemble the victim. Work allowed, again, the court's discretion. As you know, we're claiming self-defense, and part of that instruction, we're entitled to allege prior instances of difficulties and prior acts of violence, so that the defendant who asserts self-defense They're demonstrative aids to aid the jury in understanding the circumstances surrounding that relationship, the actions that Sarah took, and the reasonableness of his actions in light of their history. Thank you. Any response, State? Yes. Yes, sir. Judge, the standard is um, it is your discretion, and you will only be uh, reversed if you abuse your discretion in this regard. The State is urging you just flat out, as a matter of principle, uh, to not allow the parties to go into the exhibits uh, during opening statements. They're going to be seeing the actual exhibits in the very, very near future. Um, we can do this. We can play the videos. We can show gruesome autopsy photographs on the big screen as well during the opening statements, but those things are all coming. Um, so we're just asking you first in general, let's, let's not extend the opening statements in that regard any more than necessary. Now our specific objections, uh, are this. With A, which is beneath everything now, but the bloody ear from the fire incident, I believe that it's from a body-worn camera. I think he indicated as much it was not from her phone. If we get to that point where we know that this piece of evidence is coming in, that would be one thing. But right now, the law of the case is they cannot put on uh, any evidence of prior instances of violence, any reputation evidence regarding the victim or go into battered spouse syndrome uh, in the evidence until self-defense has been established. Self-defense must be established by the testimony, and in this particular case, it has to come from the defendant, of an overt act taken by the decedent 
which resulted in the imminent threat of great bodily harm or death. And we have had that mitigation. We have provided the court the most recent testimony uh, regarding the defendant's most recent statements from the two doctors, and there, that it doesn't exist at this time. So it's one thing for the parties to go into things in opening statements um, that don't end up coming into evidence. And when the defendant does that, well, under King versus State, State gets to point out, look, they made these promises in opening statements, and they didn't come to fruition. So you need to disregard everything that you've heard that was going to happen in trial uh, that didn't. But the problem, particularly for the State side, is we don't, we don't get to appeal. So we go through opening statements, and we have the jurors not only exposed to our words about things that may or may not be coming into evidence, but exposed to a thousand words per picture, a picture is worth a thousand words, that amplifies the error. And it's an error the state has no remedy to fix. So we're asking for A, which um, would absolutely come into evidence. If, if we get this overt act uh, testimony, um, which has not occurred yet, from the defendant, um, and certainly this is A would come in um, in, in some of the other letters and there's nothing wrong with them blowing it up like that in fact the state has it on their exhibit and, and will be showing it on the screen as well there's there's not you know, a lot of dispute over whether that will come in if we meet that uh, standard of an imminent act or over threat of imminent act danger B I'm not sure um, B was on their list of items that they sought to introduce um, from the phone. Um, we would argue a picture of her with her dogs on her porch doesn't have any relevance. I don't expect that to be coming into trial, so we're objecting on that separate ground. And then returning back to C, D, E, F, G, H, I. State is all aware of those photographs. We are prepared to introduce them ourselves. Um, through the digital evidence, there's no hiding those things. If we meet the threshold for this sort of evidence coming in, could you identify those for me? I'm trying to keep notes contemporaneously. Yes, C. It was C through I included. Yes, thank you. B is the only one that is not a, a photograph of prior violence. It's I don't. Know, it wasn't on their list of things that they sought to introduce, and um, I don't know what the relevance would be of her just sitting there on her porch. Their dogs. But A and then C through I, judge absolutely at the end of the trial, great. Blow them up, use them as, as much as you want. But in this particular case, with the rulings that the court has already made about this, based on the state's motion to eliminate, it is very dangerous to allow them to do this when we are not expecting uh, it to be admitted into evidence based on the current state of the defendant's testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ross, if you could address Exhibit B, just pre-marked as B. No, what I ruled was is that you were able to discuss them, to address them in opening. Photographs are a totally different kitty. I said nothing about letters. I said self Arguing things. I said nothing about Self-defense. I understand. Difficult. Our acts of violence. Standard instruction. But the overt act requirement remains. I mean, we've reviewed Holland and read it multiple times. Good faith. In discussions with my client, we believe there is going to be evidence of an overt act. She was facing a threat. She reacted. Understood. Your response to Exhibit B. It's the her on the back porch with the two dogs. Judge. That's not the issue. The issue is that state represented that it was not part of your exhibit list. I thought sure we put this on there, but uh, the relevance of it. Is not only did he abuse Sarah Ben, which part is he abused at all? He was threatened to abuse the dogs. 
Okay, thank you. All right. The court's prepared to roll at this point in time. Thank you both for your presentations and your argument. The court's had the opportunity to what was pre-marked as A through I inclusive. First, with regard to the portion of the 3.9 instruction, the purposes of opening statements to set the table of what the issues are, what the parties believe the facts and evidence will show. It is not a proper time to be discussing law or elements of law, and that is an element of law that will be instructed to the jury at the end of the case. The court's going to exercise its discretion for those reasons and prohibit you from using the portion of the 3.9 instruction in opening statement. You talk about this is a job that you're going to have, but I'm not going to allow you to read portions of the instruction for those reasons at this time. With regard to what was pre-marked as A through I, uh, the Holland case is clear. Before a defendant may introduce evidence of the victim's character, he must first show that there was an overt act by the victim at or about the time of the incident reasonably indicated a need for self-defense. I understand your good faith belief. I take no position on whether or not you're going to make it or not. That's something that you're going to have to establish. The concern um, is that the photographs, some of them are graphic in nature. Uh, the, the lacerations, the sutures, the bruising, facial wounds with bleeding may have such a impact such that the toothpaste cannot be pasted back in the tube, assuming that overact hurdle is not met. The court, again, takes no position on whether or not you're going to be able to meet it because I haven't heard the evidence and testimony. So the uh, court's going to exercise its discretion for those reasons. You can talk about it. And talk about it. She was a, a victim. Talk about specific, uh, some incidents that's made happen. But I'm not going to allow the photographs at this point in time for, reasons, for your utilization of them in opening statements. Any questions or clarifications with regards to the court's ruling state? No, Your Honor. Defense. Yes. All right. Are we prepared to bring in our jury at this time? They've been waiting for an hour and 20 minutes, Counselor. <clears throat> we intend to play the two minute suitcase video. Jury State. State? Again, I'm asking you to urge your discretion. They're going to hear it in the next two days of court. Um, it's in your discretion whether we're going to start using these exhibits. What's the other issue, sir? Okay. With regard to the video, I'm not going to allow proposed exhibits to be used in opening statements. It's good for the goose, it's good for the game. It's not going to allow your photographs, not going to allow the state to do anything. You can orally talk about what you believe the evidence and testimony is going to show, but the actual evidence is going to have to be presented here through witnesses or through a demonstration and publication after that evidence is admitted. You all can approach. While we approach, can somebody from your team start to speak? Please, I would appreciate it. Thank you.
Right. Any reason why we cannot bring in our jury at this time? State. Defense. All right, let's stand and bring in our panel. Good morning, y'all may be seated. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Can the parties push for a moment? All right, members of our jury, good morning. Uh, I want to just confirm before we start this morning that you complied with the court's instructions last night to not have any conversations amongst yourselves or anyone else about the persons, places, things, or charge involved in this case. Then you have not conducted any independent investigation regarding those items. You just raise your hands to confirm you complied with the court's instructions. All right, the record will reflect that all jurors have raised their hands. Members of the jury, uh, yesterday I told you that you may happen to see the lawyers in the courtroom or in the courthouse going about their affairs, and again, they're not trying to avoid you um, or speak to you because they're not allowed to. Did anyone happen to ride an elevator this morning with any of the attorneys, either for the state or for the defense? All right, juror in seat number three from my left first row. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You don't approach for a moment. And the juror in seat four, left to right, first row. Yes, sir. Who did you ride the elevator with? Do you recall who specifically, sir? M Mr. Owens. Okay, thank you. Oh, I thank you both for your honesty. I appreciate that. It's something we talked about earlier this week. That's the one thing that we required and asked of you is just be open and honest. I appreciate both of y'all's uh, open and honesty. During the ride in the elevator, was there anything that you saw or observed that would impact you or influenced you in any way to have any impact on you? Juror number three, left to right, first row. Juror number four, left to right, first row. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, um, Members of the jury, we're going to proceed with opening statements this morning. Both the state and the defense will have the opportunity to present them. I ask that you listen closely to those statements that they're going to provide. But remember, these are not evidence. This is just the party's belief as to what the facts and the evidence will show in this case. After the conclusion of the opening statements, we'll be bringing again the state's case in chief through witnesses. With that, Mr. Jay, you may proceed, sir. Final breaths on this earth. Well, 
how to express those words, you don't know have. That's what I'm going to show that it was released for about 15 minutes. That's the dependent itself of this event. Evidence is going to show George Torres dead, but this defendant's president disregard the other two died. You can see here and here. What I expect you will hear from a video that began at 11 12 p.m. 45 seconds on February 23rd, 2020, in Orange County, Florida, is a suitcase on the ground, face down, with the zippers facing the floor. You will hear Sarah, the defendant will say, for everything you've done to me. Sarah, for everything you've done to me. Sarah, Fuck you. And then the defendant laughs. Sarah. Fuck you. And the defendant laughs. Sarah. Stupid. Sarah. That's my name. Don't wear it out. Sarah. I can't fucking breathe, baby. Seriously. Yeah. That's what you do when you choke me. Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, the defendant laughs again. Sarah, I can't breathe, babe, he laughs again. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe, she laughs again. Unintelligible words. And I would submit, the evidence is going to show, because of the intoxication from alcohol, is the next thing she says. Sarah, 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 I can't breathe, baby. That's what I feel like when you cheat on me. Sarah, fuck you. I can't fucking breathe, Sarah. You should probably shut the fuck up. Sarah, shh. It's the last thing you will hear the defendant say to Mr. Torres as he is face down, zipped shut. The suitcase. That again began at 11, 12, 45 and lasts just over two minutes. At 11, 23, and three seconds PM, there's a second 22 second video and it's defendant zooming in on the suitcase. And all you hear during this 22 seconds after he's been in the suitcase since at least 11, 12 PM, one more time, Sarah. How did we get to this point where well, the next morning, the defendant wakes up late morning. Somewhere in the time, several hours. And she goes downstairs, and she got the door of the door. Eventually, we realize the first thing that I got to take me out, I think it's in the air. And five, six, seven, eight, Cherish on in this day, February 24th, 2020, 
What you will not hear are tears. You will not hear sorrow. You will hear a certain level of concern. My boyfriend and I were playing last night. Put him in a suitcase and we were playing hide and seek kind of thing. I fell asleep. Found him dead in the suitcase this morning. I don't know what happened. He had blood coming out of his mouth. I don't know if it was an aneurysm. Pulled him out of the suitcase, tried to give him CPR, using the suitcase, and I fell asleep. He's not awake, he's purple, he's not breathing. There's some instructions about how to do CPR given to her, asking about whether an AED is available to shock his heart. It's too late. He's cold, he's stiff, he's purple. We were playing hide and seek. We were playing hide and seek. This is horrible. This is horrific what happened. Like, what happened? We were playing hide and seek last night and I fell asleep. She mentions that there was blood coming out of the mouth. Yeah. 
Unmarked detective patrol cars there on the scene. And the basics of this remain the same, but there's a little more elaboration as you would expect from three detectives versus getting the 911 call. Quickly. But the basics of what the defendant tells them is we had wine, <laughs> we painted, we drew, we did puzzles. The particular wine we had was a Chardonnay from the Woodbridge Winery. The bottles, plural, are in the trash. We started about 4 p.m. after uh, Mr. Torres went to the store. Puzzles, art, listening to music, enjoying each other's company. We were just literally just enjoying one another's company. The other bottle of wine that was left over from Boar wasn't even half full, so the description is, she is saying is one bottle of wine and plus a fraction of a bottle of wine left over from the night before. Ladies and gentlemen, not all bottles of wine are mixed. Many of us may envision uh, what you would expect from a glass of wine. Bottles of wine that were recovered from the defendant's trash can were 1.5 liters, the equivalent of two standard bottles. 1.5 liter bottle of wine is 50 ounces. Given that standard serving of wine, it's 5 ounces. You can begin to keep it. And here's receipts. The day before, Saturday, February 22nd, 2020, there is a receipt from Publix for a bottle of Goodrich wine for $9.76. And then Sunday, 12.17 p.m., there is another receipt for $9.74 for a Woodbridge Chardonnay bottle of wine. And then at about 5.30 in the afternoon on February 23rd, again, there is another receipt, the same bottle of wine, the same price. And those two bottles of wine were recovered. They're going to be produced to you in evidence, and you will see that they are, in fact, magnum bottles. So... That's the context that we're dealing with when we hear things like, we only had one bottle of wine and we finished what was left in the bottle of wine from before. Ladies and gentlemen, there's two 1.5 liters that apparently were consumed by a 103 pound man and the defendant who is in the same weight class. Plus, if you believe that the defendant and the decedent would leave leftover wine from any given day, any additional wine that was remaining from 1.5 liters from Saturday. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a lot of wine. So in that context, we were just having wine, enjoying each other's company. At one point, we play hide and seek. She says she didn't zip it up all the way. There was enough room, in her words again, there was enough room for his little fingers to get out. We were still having a good time and whatever. And basically, you know, Mr. Torres is stressing out about job, his ex-wife, about money. So they're just doing puzzles and doing things to keep his mind off of it. Doing art, playing with the dogs, dancing with the dogs, playing hide and seek. We were always trying to outdo each other where we could find each other the best. When they started playing hide-and-seek, 
she went up to the shower and then got tired of hanging out in the shower and came down, and that's when she found him playing around in the suitcase. We both thought it was funny. I'm going to zip you up. Two little fingers could stick out. And she went upstairs thinking, he'll get out. We're going to have sex and go to sleep and call it a day. It's a good day. She insists that they had wine, but were not drunk. You will be able to assess that for yourselves when you hear the recording she made. No ill will between us last night. Last argument, maybe last week. Don't really argue. We came home, drink, smoke, did art, listen to music, play with the dogs. We drink what we can afford. We used to be able to afford liquor, but now we can only afford wine. That's how that day ends with the police. What they are doing, and by they I mean their province, the department, or the That's when they discover the two videos that I just described for you. And there's other things in the phone, which I will discuss with you in a little But uh, she's summoned in for another interview. She sits down and gives another interview on February 25th, now Tuesday. She does describe past instances of violence. You're going to hear about that. She's going to say, Mr. Torres had hit her with a curtain rod about a month ago. Since then, though, like we've been good? I've been good. She describes that he comes at him, that comes at her all the time. He comes at me. So it's either I flee or I try to go upstairs and go to sleep. That's usually what it is. I don't know if you talk to Brian, her husband, about any of that, but most of the time I, I flee and I go over there. There's a discussion about why she stays with him, and you'll hear that for yourself. She will say that she doesn't really want to drink. She just takes an occasional drink. She drinks to placate him, Mr. Forrest. She says that you're going to see phone videos of Mr. Cora smashing her TV in the past, a month earlier. You may see that too. But she doesn't get drunk. When she drinks, she likes being non compost mentis, her words, not mine, having her wits about herself. Then she gets to the hide and seek again and describes that they played it three times before, but had never zipped one another shut before. And they were really just running out of places to hide because it's just a town home. She does not remember, according to her, she does not remember taking any photos or videos of the night's events. At this point, they ask her, well, would you like to see it? And she says, I can't watch it. I flipped him over, I, I flipped him over, and that's where it was. Guys, this is killing me right now. That's why I flipped it over between the two videos. I, I didn't do anything intentional. Discussion over whether he had two or enough room to get any of his fingers out from the zipper. My intention was not to leave him there. We both got in there. Both of us were in there. When she went upstairs, my plan was not to, quote, he'll be up here any minute. My plan wasn't to leave him in the suitcase. Why is all this going on? It's the drinking. That's what it is. It's the drinking. I thought it was like, I thought he was okay. Guys, that's, that's how we were with each other. Nobody understands our relationship. This whole suitcase thing never happened. Though she described it, it happened. I'll never drink alcohol again. She insists that she has no injuries on her. And you don't have to take her word for it because they took photographs of her and there were no injuries on her. She insists over and over that there was no violence that day. It's like, okay, we're in a good place right now. Ask her about saying fuck you to Mr. Torres. Well, that's just being plain, playful and having a good day. 
Everybody's having a good day. I didn't touch him, nor did he touch me. Her word. What else is found on the phone? There's a conversation between uh, Mr. Torres' brother, and again, nobody knows who's using these phones at the time text messages are sent in these records that you're going to see. But it's indicated that there's a communication between one of the decedent's brothers and the owner of the phone that was taken that belongs to Ms. Boone. Text from the brother is, Yo, my daughter told me what you did, Sarah, and don't want you around any of my daughters nieces, nephews. And that's Christmas 2019, just under two months before this event. She replies for the person using her device at this point, Ugh, your quote-unquote dad hit me in the face. Next text is, Hide and seek, I shall. January 13th, there's another heated discussion. He describes it on January 13th in the text uh, to Mo, the brother again. It's a Torres thing. Boo sends a picture. Keep the fugly creep out too. It's still fugly. Lose. The brother responds, please do something with yourself, Sarah. God bless you. The defendant's response, bless you and all of you too. I'll get, in all capitals, rid of him. Then it'll be, in all capitals, better. Ugh, Torres. Referring to Mr. Torres, getting rid of. That's Uh, 
one thing that a bad person gave you is another thing that a bad person gave you. Despite that first day, there isn't that one. And of course, now these days are democracy. And it specifically ends up in the One thing or the other, but I ask the food for a cigarette, or a big doubt, and you take the money. Things like that. And they're going to be here. And it's just me. Yes, there were injuries that kind of just ended up with certain things that you lost. Blackout. <laughs> up to your face. Bloody ear. Stab wound to your leg. This is the fact that I was so excited to have to go But nonetheless, I suspect there's going to be some fear in the bottom of the ear. And that means the chin. Now, like a home investor, <coughs> there, there are experts come in and kind of help you walk everybody through the improvements and the places that they need to have to I suspect they can't make sure that the policy is just like about that itself. The state is not accounting in any way. Thank you. 
objective That's what it's meaning. It's not meaning for playing objective. Thank you, Mr. Jay. Any opening remarks by the defense? Judge, can we invoke the rule? I've already advised the witnesses. Okay, the rule sequestration will be invoked. Thank you. You may proceed, sir. Thank you. 
between Sarah Boone and George Torrance. Sarah Boone and George Torres were down and out, as you can hear. Their life centered around alcohol. Both of them suffered from what used to be called alcoholism, what was called alcohol abuse syndrome. And so day to day, they struggled with the use of alcohol. You can imagine it affected their jobs. It affected keeping employment. It affected even getting a job. As codependent as you can be towards each other. And you're going to learn with all that, this domestic violence, and that George Torres physically abused their abuse. And she suffered from the effects, the psychological effects that one suffers from repeat <coughs> violence from an intimate partner. They were together over three years. And there were several prior incidences of violence. We've got the photographs. There were incidences where police were called. We took photographs. So you're going to be able to see the evidence. And believe, we believe the court will instruct you at the end when you're considering self-defense, which we call justifiable use of non-deadly force, and justifiable use of deadly force, if you can consider the prior acts, the history of violence, the prior difficulties that the party had, you're considering her set of circumstances that she was faced with in making the decision to use reasonable force under the circumstances. And the most important thing I can tell you here today is keep an open mind. There's two sides to every story. You're going to hear the state's side in a tempting paper certain moment, as they've done here today in open mind. And then you're going to hear another side. And you're going to have to weigh that. All the evidence. The credibility of the witness photographs, the video things, and come to a conclusion. Now let's talk about this day, February 23rd, 2020, the date of this event. This case has been pending for some time. Here we are, October 2024. I think the evidence is going to show that they had purchased some wine the day before and they hadn't finished all of that. So it was in the refrigerator. Many times that's how they start their day. At some point, you're going to see a video from Publix from where they live. I believe it's going to park. Publix was not too far from their apartment complex. Took their car, they drove over there. So you're going to see a videotape from Publix in both going in the store about noon, and they come out with one of these larger bottles of the wine, and then, of course, there's a receipt for the bottles or in the barbecue. Of course, there obviously is an attraction between the two. 
And as everybody knows, um, couples can have great times when things split, everybody gets along, and then we can have episodes of disagreement. And how are they usually talking? Good. How are they usually talking? But George was very jealous of Sam. You can hear the testimony about that. And that he cannot, in certain situations, <coughs> he's very charming. But when his level of intoxication gets to a certain level, is when it begins. Bad, really, and a lot of times eventually it involves forcible sex with Sarah Boone, or actual physical violence. The thought the line, it's a simple life, they don't have much money, but they both like art, they did that for a while, they both like puzzles, they did that for a while. Well, about five or so, the wine bottle was in, and George had said, oh, I'm going to get some seats. So there's a convenience store right close by their apartment complex, and, and Sarah thought he was just going to walk over there and get the back. But no, what he did was, he got her key. I think that was about five, five days. And again, look through the uh, public video showing him going in and going out. He was able to see the purchase of that bomb and the entry of that bomb. He was able to see all the other bombs. Well, when he comes in with the second bottle, Sarah, this is not good. She knows this means he's going to get to another level of life. So, Sarah's going to see. <coughs> attempts to placate him, keep him busy, keep him in a good mood, and drink that bottle. She drinks his way. And at some point, they're intoxicated at a high level. As some people do when they're drunk, they get silly and they decide to play a game of hide and seek. She goes upstairs, the bedroom's upstairs, to the shower and waits for a period of time. And he doesn't come to her. <coughs> At some point, she gets cold, she gets tired, she wants to go see, and we got it mixed up. Where is he? So she goes downstairs and they had gotten a suitcase down a week or so ago, an old suitcase, uh, that they were going to donate to help a hand to the or somebody. And they were putting some items in there. And it's a broken down suitcase, it's large. They both play about it. Uh, don't eat them. Now, now nurse, the large but the cool hand is broken off. And they attached a little uh, paper clip that has a rubber around and that's kind of like a little type of thing. Well she comes down the step, she sees him getting in and settling in the city. So she walks over there and you know they see each other, they smile and laugh, and she she zips him up. And she zips him up and they laugh for a while. And they carry on. She sits on the couch. And at some point he says, I can't push it. Now, his face is facing the zipper and she's got she's got the in there. She's over there. And she doesn't know. They're intoxicated. She doesn't know whether he's just saying that to try to hear and get him out or what. But he's a captive audience. Physically, they're the same size. He's much stronger 
If they got in a fist fight, he would win a hundred times out of a hundred. But she's got him down. Why he can't get up? He has to sit and listen. It's a weak form of physical restraint. And so she lets him have it. Says then she should not say. We'll see the video. It's about two minutes long. She videotapes. She sits on the couch and turns her phone on and videotapes for about two minutes. There's another video. It's approximately 11 minutes long. The first video, George's, this is Casey's foot comes up now. It's it for 11 minutes later, Sarah has flipped the right side up. Again, hoping for him to get out. And it's only 22 seconds. And you hear George say, Sarah. Now the key to the case is that 11 minutes. And what happened during that 11 minutes? Okay. That is the key to this case. Sarah Boone will take the stand. She will explain what happened. She will explain why it happened. The evidence will show that she was justified in the action she took to prevent an attack on George Floyd, which the law acknowledges that every one of us has the right to a right to provide a help. <clears throat> you can hear from the medical examiner. She is going to tell you about some bruising on George Torres. Of course, he was in the suitcase a while. He seems to be doing And that changes things a little bit. There's some bruising. Sarah is going to explain that to you. Why that happened? What were the circumstances around it? You fall into that. Your son comes and stays with him from time to time. He has his own room. He has several of his things there. And there's a bat. That's there. The same bat that George Torres used in a video that George is threatening out there. And he's swinging the bat to the by the time he can and he does it about six or seven times you can see that there's a corner. And it's during an argument and he's trying to intimidate. <coughs> Sarah loves you. Now you're going to hear why. Why we love you. Why we love you. And you're going to hear about Sarah being in her struggles. Her mental health struggles. Sarah had wanted to get to see the mission. She wanted to go back. Father's condition, she loved him. She hated his news. She couldn't leave. She tried. She tried kicking him out six or seven times. He kept coming back. She changed a lot. He kept coming back. 
She didn't have the family. She didn't have the support. She was weak. Vulnerable. You gotta hear it all. You gotta take that all into account. To try to understand what happened. And the circumstances around this tumultuous relationship. <coughs> now you're gonna find that Sarah's not perfect. And you know she goes Many of us do when we drink too much. We sleep in. She slept in. 11, 12, 1, somewhere around there. She moses downstairs looking for George. Thought he was on the computer looking for a job. She looked outside. Maybe he's out smoking a cigarette. But she sees the suitcase. She unzips it. She gets him out. He's purple. She tries her best to do some CPR. She freaks out. She, she, the, only, the only family she's got is her. She lies on him. The prosecutor said a lot of times she'll flee to her ex husband's house. To her son in that. Lucas. The only thing she knows to do, she's kind of a, she's kind of a sheltered daughter, and she was young. Smart, but she's, she's not worldly. She calls Brian. What do I do? He said, I'm going to, please, please come up. He's, he's about five minutes away. And she calls him again within a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the way. He gets there. He walks in the foyer and sees the blood. He says, call 911. She calls 911. Uh, Detective Rodriguez arrives, and we got the body cam now. So it's recorded. So you're going to hear Sarah talking. But Sarah's freaking out. Sarah's thinking, I'm, I'm somehow responsible. Eventually, she gives a statement. She gives one to Detective or Deputy Rodriguez because she's not the homicide. She just responds. You know, they know what to do. They try to assess the situation. They try to get out. And then they call for the homicide investigation. Which takes a little time. Um, so she gets a statement from Sarah. Eventually, the homicide detective gets a statement from Sarah and the, one of the unmarked squad cars. And it's recorded. That do that. And then the next day, they, they take Sarah's phone. Sarah gets new phone. She signs the consent to take the phone. Take it to, uh, they have a phone. Phone extraction people. The church phone. They got all the data. They got all the data. All the phone calls, the photographs, the videos. And they finally see the video. Sarah's not aware. She doesn't remember making the decision. She's a mess. Give her phone. Well, she makes no attempts to do anything other than Here's the phone. So they tell her, you, you, you're going to get your phone back tomorrow. We'll bring it back tomorrow. You know, they end up having a conversation with the team on the day. On the first day. Awesome. She wants to talk. And they end up, Jeffy talks to his friend. They end up, hey, um, we're not going to bring your phone. I'm not feeling good. I can, can you come to the sheriff's office, please? 
Sure thing was to tell me that that was what I was doing. That's what he told me to do. Sure. Well, instead, it was interrogation. They were going to arrest her. They made their mind up on her. And they were going to confront her, try to get her to confess, and they wanted to videotape her. And so there's approximately a two hour interrogation that was on the 25th of the afternoon when she got there. She was home, and said, Hey, can I come up here? And we had her in the room, it's a small room that's been videotaped and audio tape. And it goes on for about two hours of him trying to get a confession. The motive. It does happen. But Sarah lies. She's scared, she can tell they're trying to pin her on this, that this was some kind of intentional act. And it was not. So she lied. She's not a woman. She doesn't know about so she doesn't understand. She has the lawful right to defend herself. She doesn't understand that she's justified in the use of the force that she needs. She doesn't I wasn't there to revive her. No lawyer was there. So she won. And we didn't hear that. So you're gonna have to balance that versus her taking the stand and testify to you. And we simply ask that you look for the evidence of the application of her testimony. It's gonna be later, probably next week. The judges will tell you and read an instruction on evaluating the She's going to have to weigh that in her testimony. Now, self defense, you know, we talked about it in jury selection, usually a gun, some deadly weapon. Suitcase in this case with the physical restraint or a blocking of an attack. It was unconventional. Self defense, nonetheless. Now, as I said, the struggles that occurred, many of them involved in this. So, you're going to actually hear from some of the police officers. Maybe some body cameras. And see some photographs and put the injuries to the book. And some of the videos you may see her in kind a of very happy, joyful type of thing. Well, number one, she's a hot baby, but number two, she's safe. Please don't. So her attitude is not a one of those things. You know, we're here, we're here today, it's full, packed full room. The train is here, but, but you're the most important thing. Because you've got to decide this thing. Honestly, fairly, according to the law. And we talked about the two biggest principles in the Constitution that apply. In this case, and in every case in which a citizen like Sarah Boone is brought into a courtroom and accused of the first. The first is, you as a juror must presume or believe that Sarah is innocent. And that belief stays with you throughout the entire time. Because of that, she doesn't have to prove it. That's why the state went first. In jury selection, that's why the state went first today, that's why the state will go first putting on their case. They have the burden of proof, and it's the highest burden to be recognized in any type of litigation in this country. Proof beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. You are going to have doubts about this case. 
But the most important thing is not to rush the judgment, to keep an open mind, and understand there's two sides to the faith. There's their side and the God's side. So you can't only fix opinions early on. That's hard to do, as Mr. Henderson said in open mind, very much. That's extremely hard to do. Now, you're going to hear some testimony. You can mention that. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of women in danger. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of women in danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death in a situation others would not. After hearing both sides of this case, we're confident you're going to have a reasonable doubt. We're going to ask you to follow the law and do justice in this case. And find Sarah Ben not look because it's the right thing. Thank you, sir. Can the parties approach for a moment? State, you may call your first witness. State, you call which one for it? Sir, good morning. You could be seated. And once seated, you would state and spell your name for the record for us, please. Juan Torres, J U A N T O R. Thank you, sir. You may inquire, Mr. Good Morning, sir. Uh, can you tell us how it is that you know who was He's my older brother. And uh, how many siblings do you have? Six. And how long has your family resided here in the Central Florida area? Uh, Twenty years. 
and uh, before residing in the Central Florida area, uh, were you guys in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Yes, sir. In Massachusetts. Um, your brother, um, how often, uh, your brother uh, George, that is, uh, how often would you talk to him? Uh, often? Yeah. Uh, say, on a week basis. And how far away did you live from George? Uh, 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 ten minutes. Very close. Did you see him pretty often? I would try not to go away too much. Who did, uh, who was George living with at the time that he passed? Him? Sarah. And without getting into many details, what was your relationship like? Uh, we really didn't have a relationship. Would it be fair to say you didn't get along with her? Yes. Back on February 23rd of 2020, um, did you have an occasion uh, to talk to the brother on that day? Yes, sir. And when you spoke with your brother on that day, um, did you FaceTime with him or did you speak with him over the we talked on the uh, phone. Was that phone to your ear or was that phone? It was uh, on speaker. And who was present? My wife and my two kids. And without telling us anything that uh, George may have said to you, um, can you tell us uh, what that conversation, what the topic of that conversation just, we were just talking, like, you know, he just, he just wanted me to check on me, um, basically. Now, in the background of that conversation <laughs> on the evening of February 23rd, 2020, what did you hear? Sarah's in the background, uh, yelling. You recognized her voice? Yes. What was she yelling about? Something about choking, how he choked. You know, that pretty much that was. It. About how long was this conversation that you had? Um, Ten minutes. <laughs> how did the conversation end? Because she was yelling in the back. Did she sound upset? She sounded upset. Did you talk to your brother after that conversation? No, that was the last conversation. Have you ever spoken to Sarah since that conversation? Mm -hmm. No further questions. A cross examination. In the beginning, when you started, it's hard for me to hear. But I know you were talking about her, so I don't know if you can hear. Uh, could you repeat that for me, please? Here in, in Orlando, I have one sister and three brothers. Sister and three brothers? Now, did your brother George Torres, did he ever stay with you at any time? No. 
we ever live with you or any of the, I mean, not you, but any of the other siblings? No. All right, so let's go back to this phone call that you were talking about. It was on February 23rd of 2020. And that phone call was approximately 7.30. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And who, who called you? You called me. And then y'all were talking. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, when he called you, uh, did you notice anything about his speech or his voice? <clears throat> no, he was fine. Sounded normal? Yes. Okay. So he wasn't slurring his words or anything like that? No. Uh, by the way, he talked or what he talked to you about. Could you tell at that time if he had been consuming that? Mm, no. Because I knew what he was. Okay. So, in your opinion at that time, based on what you heard and what he was talking about, you do not believe he had been drinking alcohol? No. Now, you said you heard Sarah. Yes, that right. How did you know it was Sarah? I can tell him. Recognize her voice. So you can hear her. Is that correct? Eat. Alright. Uh, and you heard Sarah speak before this. Before that time. Is that correct? Yes. And you heard her speak on the phone before that time. Is that correct? And you said that Sarah was yelling. Is that correct, sir? And she was yelling about he's choking me. Or tell him about choking me. Yes. During that conversation, and you heard her say that, did you ask your brother, what is she talking about? No, I did not. Did that statement at that time, did that statement surprise you? Not really. You've heard it before? No. Based on Sarah's voice that you heard, uh, was there any indication to you that she had been right? No. Sir, uh, at some point your brother said he had to go, correct? Yes. And, uh, did he hang up on the conversation? Yes. And did he say bye? Did he say bye? Yes. Thank you, sir. I don't have to. You may, sir. Or other than um, siblings, your mother and father, do they live in this area? Yes. Uh, are there times that George would stay with them? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No problem. Any redirect examination? No, Your Honor. This witness be released. Yes, Your Honor. That's actually we'll keep him subject to recall, Your Honor. Okay. All right, sir. You release subject to recall by other party. Thank you. State would call Devin Jamro.
Sir, good morning. You can take a seat and please state and spell your name for the record. My name is Devin Jamro. That's D E V I N J A M R O. Thank you. You may inquire, sir. Sir, who do you work for? I work for public supermarkets. And what is your position with public supermarkets? I am the assistant store manager. And at what location? Uh, currently at Castleberry location. On uh, Goldenrod and University Boulevard back in February 2020? Yes, I was. Your Honor, may I approach the witness which has been previously marked by identification as states D and been shown to the defense? D is in Delta? D is in Delta. Yes, you may. Sir, I'm showing you it's been marked by identification as states D. Could you uh, use these scissors and open uh, and open this and look at the contents of the package? Uh, your side. Sir, do you recognize those items? I do, yes. Then tell us, what are these items? Uh, these are Publix receipts. Are these uh, receipts um, evidence of transactions at Publix that were made at or near uh, the time of the transaction? They are absolutely made at the time of the transaction. And is it in the normal course of business that Publix keeps these receipts? Yes. And these fairly and accurately uh, appear to be the receipts uh, from your public. Yep. Yeah. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move the previously remarked by identification of States D into evidence. Any objections? All objection. What was pre marked as States D will be received into evidence without objection, States 1. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been previously marked for identification as states J and shown to the not. You may. So I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as states J. Can you take a look at that disc? Yes. Do you see your initials on that disc? I do. Did you have an opportunity to look at that disc uh, prior to coming to court? I did, yes. And tell us, what is that disc? Uh, this is CCT foot CCTV footage uh, burned from the camera system at the location. And at uh, Publix, is it uh, the regular practice of Publix to utilize surveillance video? Yes. And in the normal course of business, are the uh, videos from those surveillance cameras kept? Yes. And are these the cameras taken from February 23rd, 2020? And I believe there's two video clips included, one at 1217 uh, p.m. and another at approximately 539 p.m.? Yes. And they fairly and accurately represent the surveillance video uh, that was submitted for public law enforcement. They do, yes. All right, this time I'd like to move the previously marked for identification of states J and evidence. Any objections? No objections. 
is pre-marked as States J, will be received at evidence without objection to States 2. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? Can this witness be released? Yes. Thank you, sir. You're released. Thank you. Have a great day. State, you may call your next witness. State will call Joe Williams. Pam, good morning. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Jim, J O E N Williams, W I L L I A M S. Thank you, ma'am. Counsel, your name for Good morning, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us what it is that you do for a living? I'm a 911 call taker. And how long have you held that position? And tell us what are your duties as a 911 call taker? Um, I answer phones for an emergency, non emergency, medical insurance. It's very totally sad of business. And is it the regular practice of Orange County uh, to record 911 calls? All lines are recorded. And is it the regular practice? Of Orange County to keep records of each of those 911 calls. Yes. And those records are made at or near the time of each call, correct? Right? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness which has been previously marked for identification as states L and been shown to the best? May. Ma'am, I'll show you what's been previously marked for identification as states L. Do you recognize this disc? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to uh, review this disc prior to coming to court this year? Yes. And those are your initials on the disc? Yes. And does this disc, does it fairly and accurately uh, represent the 911 call that you took in this case on February 24, 2020 at 12 your Honor, at this time I'd like to move the previously remarked for identification to States L into evidence. Any objections? It was pre marked as States L will be received with no objection as States 3. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Any cross examination? No, sir. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. Can the parties approach momentarily? State, you may call your next witness. State will call Vincent the Cavalier. Thank you. 
So you may be seated. After you're seated, if you can state and spell your name for the record for us. Vincent Battaglia, V-I-N-C-E-N-T-B-A-T-T-A-G-L-I-A. Thank you. So you may inquire. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us what it is you do for us? Uh, right now I work for an auto parts company. And where are you live? Uh, New Jersey. Back on February of 2020, where were you living at that time? I was living at the Tealwood Apartments in New Jersey. And what were you doing uh, at that time uh, when you were living at Tealwood? I was enrolled in Full Sail University. I was in school. Um, when you were living at Tealwood, uh, did you have any roommates? Yeah. Yeah, I had uh, one roommate, Brandon. Um, yeah, that was it. That's Brandon Motes. Uh, did you have neighbors? Yeah. Uh, were you neighbors with uh, with uh, Sarah Boone and George Torres? Yes. And uh, approximately how long were you neighbors? About a year. A little over a year. I moved there in January 2019. And... During the course of that year that you were neighbors with them, uh, did you have Asians interact with them? Yeah. Um, in fact, did you uh, mm-hmm. ever go over to their home? Yeah, like a couple times, yeah. And uh, I believe you tuned a guitar for a child there at the house? Yeah. Um, this Tealwood uh, apartment complex, um, how would you describe uh, the walls that separated your units? Thin. Like, very thin walls. And with those walls being so thin, uh, would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling coming from Sarah, Sarah Boone and George Torres's apartment? How often would you hear this? Almost daily. Did did Sarah Boone ever approach you about the things that you heard coming from their apartment? Yes. And where were you when she approached you? I was smoking a cigarette on my back patty. And approximately what time? It was pretty late. I can't remember the exact time, but it was definitely anywhere between like midnight to 2 a.m. Like around there. And do you remember how uh, how much before uh, the date when the police called that this occurred? Uh, a few months. Like it would probably four to five months before. Four or five months before February of 2020. And when she approached you on this late evening slash early morning that day, what did she tell you? Pretty much just kind of like, if, if I do hear anything, like through the walls or whatever is out back, just kind of keep my mouth shut. Like, don't really speak about it or Thing like that, or say anything to anyone. I uh, just okay. did she make any motions with her hands? Yeah, like just kind of like you know, finger over the lips, like kind of shh, like, keep it hush, like that kind of thing. So she told you not to report anything you may have heard about arguments or yelling or fighting, anything going on. Do you recall the evening of February 23rd, 2020? I, I do, yeah. And 
What about that evening sticks out? The that sticks out to me from that night was literally just the loud. There was a very very loud noise that I heard that was loud and powerful enough to shake my bedroom wall, and I remember that because I was sitting on my bed on FaceTime with my girlfriend at the time, and I literally felt the wall shake and stop me mid conversation. She even asked me. What was that? And I was like, I have no idea. Did you hear any yelling <clears throat> coming from their apartment on that night? Before that, yeah. Like, it was just uh, arguing kind of stuff. What was the last thing you heard? The last thing I heard was, like, the, the loud noise and just a little bit of shuffling, and that was kind of it. I just kind of went silent and did you hear anything that was being said? Not, not clearly. And it, uh, it was never really anything clear. It was just like me here arguing back and forth. It's kind of like, um, and kind of like an I hate you, I hate you, or like it's whatever it is, whatever the art goes about. Kind of thing. At the time, it's really all it was. It was never really clear enough to like argue. And honestly, I never really paid attention to too much to it. If I heard it, I kind of stepped into the room and further away. Did you hear both the defendant's voice and also George Torres? Yeah, yeah. All the time, you, it was like a back and forth. So, other than the statements and the phrases of I hate you, I hate you, you weren't able to discern the Contents of this art. No. What was the last sound you heard? The last sound that I heard was like the, the loud banging noise that, um, it was like a very odd sounding noise that I've never heard before this day, but it very much sounded like it was like where my bed was positioned. It was kind of towards the back of the apartment. And it almost sounded like it was coming towards me, but like on the side of me. You know, then it was just like a loud rumbling noise. That literally sounded like it was kind of far away from me, and then it like ended up almost next to me. Like I said, the walls are thin, so like it's very easy to hear. The walls, and not even just sideways, like I hear from upstairs, and you really all around, very thin. Now, was your bedroom, uh, where was it located in your the back of the apartment, so it was like there's like a little kick out next to my patio, and that's like that was my bedroom back. They gave up all the grass back there. on the first floor. on the first floor. Yeah, I have no further questions. Any cross examination? Mm -hmm. uh, you said that you lived there next to Sarah Ben and uh, George Torres for about a year. Yes, sir. Are you aware that uh, the police were called to their residence, like while you were while you were there for the year? Are you aware of any any incident in which the police were called to their residence? I had never seen anybody there, but I had had other neighbors in the complex tell me that it has been on multiple occasions. So that's why. Just, I, just instead of what somebody else told you, yeah, yeah, just what you would have told. Did you ever? The year that you were there, let me ask it in. Yeah. Whoever, were you ever aware that the police were called? Police? No, I, the, the times that I was home, I never, I never saw any police at the, at the apartment. Did you work odd hours or? Yeah, and with my schooling and stuff too, I used to have class at like one o'clock in the morning, so I, all the time I was at random moments, like just not home throughout the day and night and stuff like that, so. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not, based on your interaction with Sarah Boone, let me finish the question first, please. Do you, do you know, from your experience with Sarah Boone, and your experience with George Torres, if they drank alcohol? Yeah. Hang on. I'll withdraw to that question. Thank you. Yes. Are you aware that they, they both consumed alcohol to excess? Yes. Thank you. 
Yes, sir, of course. Well, Vincent, I think you would testify, you, you may have given a statement to law enforcement. Yes, it was one of the detectives. A recorded statement? Yes, I can't remember his name. Yet. And I think it was on February 23rd of 2020? Uh, yeah, right around that time, yeah. I believe you had said that... Um, the Jeff is the uh, improper impeachment. The brochure. Objections overruled for now. So would it be fair to say on that day you got home around 7? 7, 7 uh, p.m. 7 p.m.? Yeah. Uh, which day was this? Sunday, February 23rd, 2020. Uh, no, that day I actually got home from work probably around like 1 or 2 o'clock or so. In the morning? No, in the afternoon. Because I went to work that morning at around 5 a.m. And you said that uh, you heard the normal yelling and arguing at about that time when you got home. Um, no, it was it, well, yeah, it was around that time, but it was really around like ten o'clock, ten thirty is when like the arguing I could right here clearly. It was like around ten thirty at night. Thank you. Thank you. He redirect. Yes, sir. So on uh, cross examination, you were asked uh, about uh, the, the arguing you heard, and I believe your testimony was that it was pretty in, uh, intense around ten thirty. Yeah. Uh, approximately what time was it that you heard? This loud crashing bump sound that you described. Um, little after that. Um, it was a little after that arguing and stuff. It was probably around 11, 11, 15, probably 30, 45 minutes after like, the arguing I could hear started. No other questions. Can this witness be released? Yeah. Not subject to recall. You would like him subject to recall. Okay. Yes. All right, sir, you are released, not subject to recall. Have a great day. Thank you. State would call Brandon Motes. Bless you. Thank you, sir. You can be seated. State and spell your name for the record. Uh, yeah, my name is Brandon Motes, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-M-O-A-T-S. Thank you. Uh, good 
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, can you tell us um, how it is that you uh, knew Sarah Boone? Uh, I moved into the apartment next door to her when I was in college. And so, when was that that you were in college? Uh, I would have moved down here in 2019 and would have been there in 2021. So she was your neighbor at Tealwood Apartments, is that correct? Uh, yeah, it would have been Tealwood back then, yeah. And uh, did you have any roommates? Back uh, yes, I, I was rooming with uh, Vincent Patak. Yeah. And uh, during that time, uh, what were you doing? Uh, like... As far as work in school. Oh, uh, I was just going to school. You, uh, during the time of this, yeah, I would have just been going to school. I don't think I would have had my job yet. So I was just a student. Uh, did you have much interaction uh, with the defendant or with George Torres in this case? Honestly, I avoided them as much as possible, usually. Um, the apartment where you live... Um, Tell us, how would you describe the walls that separated uh, so, the units? Yeah, uh, I remember that my bedroom was like the front-facing bedroom, and our walls shared a wall with where their staircase was. So, like, the way the apartments were laid out, we had a one-story apartment, they had a two-story apartment, so they had a staircase running right next to the walls next to, uh, like, our bedrooms. Would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling uh, going on inside of the defendant's apartment? Yes, they, they, the, the walls were pretty thin, so if people were you could definitely hear it. And how often would you hear arguments or disagreements going on? When I first moved in, it was so, like, it was at least, like, once a week to the point that I started tuning them out. Like, I, I got good enough at just, like, not listening to them. They are used very, very often. Did you, do you recall the evening of February 23rd, 2020? Yes, sir. And on that evening, could you hear arguing going on in their unit? Uh, not late into the evening, earlier into the evening, probably, like, Seven eight o'clock. That, uh, that probably, like early, yeah, earlier on, I hear arguing. And where were you inside of your apartment? Uh, I would have been in my bedroom pretty much all night. And your bedroom, just so that uh, we can paint the picture. Oh, uh, where would that uh, would have been on the first floor or the second? We had a we had a first floor apartment. Okay. All the units were. Or all the bedrooms were on the... Yeah, like I was saying before, uh, we had a one-story apartment, and then they next door had, like, a two-story townhouse. So we only had the one floor. And at a certain point in the evening, did you hear a loud crash? Yeah, probably around 10, 30, 11 o'clock that evening. And... What did you describe that sound for us in more detail? Uh, I mean, yeah, at literally, like I said, at like 10 30, 11 o'clock, it's uh, the way their staircase was set up. I could, uh, my bedroom, the top of their staircase would have been like above my ceiling. It ends next to where like my roommate's apartment was. So I could hear something that start above me super loud and then fall away from me at, like at, like it was falling down the stairs. Did this, um, did this affect the walls that were between your two apartments? Oh yeah, me and my roommate, literally, I remember me and my roommate talking the next day about like we could literally like it shook both of our rooms. Did you ever have occasion to talk with the defendant about what happened? I never saw her after that. She would have. Yeah, she. Uh, I never saw her after that happened. 
Any cross examination? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, you were asked by the state if uh, you had had, had any interactions with um, Sarah Boone or George Torres. That correct? Yes, sir. I think you said you shot George Boone. Y- yeah, uh, I don't like drunk people, and they were drunk a lot, so I did not interact with them. Do you, re- you remember this interaction with Sarah Boone? In 2009, you woke up and witnessed this. It would have been nine years old in 2009. I'm sorry, 2019. Yes. In 2019, when you woke up and witnessed Sarah sleeping on the concrete patio. Oh, this uh, this may have been a slight misconception in how I said this. I never uh, saw, uh, woke up and saw her sitting on the patio myself. That... Uh, I would have seen her on the patio eventually, but it's not like I woke up and went back and saw her on the patio. Uh, this was my roommate relaying the story that she had fallen, uh, fallen asleep on the back patio, and then I, like, saw her. Well, you did not wake this up. Did you see her? I saw her asleep on the back patio. I was just uh, clearing up the sequence of events there. Uh, another time... Uh, do you recall our interaction with Miss Boone when you were coming home from school and uh, she was trying to talk to you and she seemed paranoid and rambling? Yeah, I had I had gotten locked out of my apartment, so I was waiting on the uh, steps to I was waiting on the steps outside of my apartment for my roommate to get home. So she came up and started talking to me. Uh, I don't really remember too many like details of what she was saying because I didn't want to talk to her. She didn't, but, yeah. Okay. Do you remember saying that you believe Sarah was avoiding going into her apartment? That's definitely the vibe. I don't remember what she was saying, but like the vibe she was giving off was that she didn't want to go home. I believe, and I just want to make sure that I heard that you said that the first argument, other than the boom, which was like 10 something, uh, initially it was around 7, 7 p.m. You heard arguing? It would have, yeah, because it would have been. I rem- I remember that day I got home from class around five because uh, I get yeah got out of class around four thirty usually and walked home so I would have gotten home around five five thirty and it would have been after I took because I came home I made myself lunch and I took a shower and then I heard all of their arguing so it would have been about an hour and a half two hours after I got home so around seven to eight o'clock. And during that time, you say argument, you get back into it. Uh, I, honestly, I wouldn't really be able to say if it was back and forth. I, I don't know too, like, I wouldn't remember too, too vividly if it was back and forth. Let me ask you this. Did you hear a male voice? I, yes, I heard a male voice. Did you hear a female voice? No flap. Yes. I can confirm. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. He redirect. No, you're not. Can this witness be released? Yes, you're not. All right. All right, sir, you're released, subject to recall. Thank you. The parties approach.
members of our jury, thank you so much for your time, your attention, and your participation in this very important process. It is 1221. At this point in time, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch break. I'm going to ask that you return here uh, no later than 2 p.m. so we can pick up at that point in time outside of here, 12 Alpha in the Orange County Courthouse. And I'm going to give you an instruction. You're going to hear this instruction a lot over the next couple of days. Um, jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, using a computer, a cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps, pictures, to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors, do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have any discussions of any sort with friends, family members, even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, please leave your pens and your notepads on each chair. The deputy will collect them. We'll see you at 2 o'clock, and thank you for your service. Y'all may be seated, thank you. State, anything we need to address? Vince, uh, Ms. Boone, I just got a couple of inquiries of you, ma'am, for release. Are you satisfied with your attorneys so far throughout this trial? Yes. And are you on board with the strategy that they've deployed so far in this trial? Thank you very much. We'll be in recess till 2 o'clock. Or it's off the record.
All right, we're back on the record. State of Florida versus Sarah Boone, 2020 CF 2603. Can I get appearances for counsel for the record, starting with counsel for the state? David Fisher, on behalf of the state. William J. from the state. Defense. County Henderson, Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is seated at counsel's table, wearing the same black suit and pink blouse from this morning. Um, state, anything we need to address before we bring back in our panel? We get the evidence protection system up to test it before we yes. arrive. Yes, sir. <laughs> if you want to test it out, Mr. J. Call one, set well at 59 p.m. with a GMT offset of minus 300 minutes. Call on month. Call one at twelve fifty nine PM with a GMT offset of minus three hundred. That is the best I can do, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else, state? We need to address. Not this time, Your Honor. Defense. Okay. All right. Uh, just in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, there are some uh, persons behind me to my right and my left. I run the mock trial program at Barry University School of Law here in town. These are some of my students as a member of that program, so they're here just simply to observe. So pay no mind or attention to them. Uh, with that, we're ready to bring in our jury. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. All right. Let's stand and bring in our panel. Jury answer.
State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Beth, do you recognize our jury? Y'all can be seated. Thank you. <laughs> Members of the jury, good afternoon. I hope you did enjoy your lunch. If you could, again, by a show of hands, confirm that you complied with those instructions that we gave prior to the break. Record reflect all jurors' hands have been raised. With that, the state is going to continue with their evidence presentation this afternoon. State, you may call your next witness. Stephen Paul Brian Boo. Yes. Sir, good afternoon. You could be seated. After seated, if you could please state and spell your name for the record for us. Uh, Brian Boone, B R I A N B O O N E. Thank you, sir. You may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, can you tell us how it is that you know the defendant? Um, I dated her for quite a while, and then we eventually got married. You say you dated her for quite a while. Um, how long are we talking? Um, I met her in the late 90s, and I believe it was around 2005 when we got married. Did you have any children as a result of your marriage? Yes, we had one son. And uh, how old was that son? Um, he is currently getting ready to turn 14. Um, did your marriage with the defendant last? And no, it did not. And approximately when was it that you uh, separated and began proceeding towards the case? Um, probably 2017, I'm thinking maybe. And... At that time, um, when was your divorce actually finalized? Um, oh, maybe it was 2016. I think the divorce was 2017. I believe. <laughs> and after your divorce, uh, what was your custody arrangement uh, with your son that you had in common? Um, she was supposed to have him on Mondays and Tuesdays. I would have him Wednesday, Thursdays, and then we would alternate Friday through Sundays every other week. So one week you would have five days with your son, and another week she would have five days. Correct. And was this still the same custody arrangement in February of 2020? Yes. And in February of 2020, um, did you have, uh, do you recall the events that occurred, I guess, first on the, the late evening of February 23rd, 2020? Um, on that evening, uh, uh, well, apparently, uh, Sarah called me at one point during the night. Do you recall about what time she called you? I think it was 11-something. When you answered the phone, how did Sarah sound on the phone? She sounded like she had been drinking and was pretty drunk. Were you able to understand what the defendant was saying? Um, Somewhat, but she woke me up. I had work the next day. I was asleep when she called. Um... She's done this before, calling me late at night. And generally, I kind of just try to ignore it, so I wasn't really paying attention. Um, who was she living with at that time? Uh, George Torres. When she called you late that evening, uh, could you hear George in the background at all? Not that I remember, no. Did you pay much attention to this phone call? No. 
Now, the following morning, on February 24th, 2020, did you begin to call the defendant? Yes, I did. Question. Approximately what time did you begin to call the defendant? Um, I think it was like 11 o'clock or something. And why was it that you were calling? Um, well, it was going to be Monday. Um, I had had him on Sunday and dropped him off at school, and I was going to try and find out if she was going to be actually picking him up that day. Why would you have a question about whether or not she was picking him She wasn't generally very good about actually getting him on the day she was supposed to. So it was not uncommon for you to have to remind her uh, to pick him up or to make sure that she she was in a pick. Well, I mean, remind or just find out if she was going to or if she was just going to give him over to me as what happened. Do you remember at what time on February 24th you actually got in touch with the defendant? Um, it was like 12.30 or something. And when you actually got in touch with her, what did she tell you on the phone? Um, that George was dead, and if I would come over. Did she say what happened to him? Um, I don't remember if she told me then on the phone or when I got there, but she told me they had been playing hide-and-seek and that she fell asleep. What did you advise her to do? Um, I told her she needed to call 911 and that I would come over as soon as I could. And this is on your first phone call here at approximately 12.30? Yes. 2.24? Yes. Did she, did she call you again while you were en route to her residence? She did. She called to find out if I was um, still to be coming over. And when you spoke with her <laughs> while you were en route, what, if anything, did you advise her? I told her she needed to call 911 and told her I was on my way, but she needed to get somebody over there. How long did it take you to arrive? At her residence. From the first phone call or? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I don't live, I mean, I live a minute or two drive away, but I had to get my puppy. We had just gotten a puppy recently. I had to get him in his crate and stuff like that and put something on because I was working. Um, um, Total time, maybe 10 minutes. When you arrived at her apartment, um, tell us us what she told you when you arrived. Um, That, um, I mean, George was dead. And I, once again, I don't remember if she told me now or before that um, they had been playing hide and seek and she fell asleep, but... I, at that time, told her again she needed to get 911 called to get somebody over there. Did she call 911 at this point? No, she had not. So you've advised her now three times to call 911? Yes. Did you go inside of her apartment? I walked in the front door into the little tiled area, like entranceway thing. What, if anything, did you observe when you made it to that point? Um, looking into the living room, I could see like feet into his feet, and maybe a little bit of some legs that were kind of coming out around uh, the back side of the kitchen. Yeah. Did you continue to go into the apartment? No. Where did you go? Um, Sarah told me she was going to call 911 and go outside and have a cigarette and a drink and asked me to come out there with her. And I told her that I didn't really feel comfortable being inside. And I went out front and got in my car and waited for people to show up. Did you witness the defendant call 911? Um, I think I was in there when she dialed it and first got somebody on the phone. 
but I wasn't there for the whole conversation. No, I was outside. Did you stay there at the scene while the police arrived? Yes. I I was there. I was part of it. I knew I'd have to talk to somebody still. So. Did you talk with law enforcement? I did. Sure, I have no further questions at this time. <laughs> Thank you. Any cross-examination? <laughs> Do you have any more questions for the people in the Okay. All right, sir. You're subject to recall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just as long as you remain subject. My understanding is subject to recall. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. State, you may call your next witness. Do you want to make your first call? Yes. Members of the jury, we'd appreciate your patience for a few moments while uh, the state um, attaches a Bluetooth speaker so that they may publish some evidence that's been received so far. Mr. J, whenever you're ready, sir. You may do so. Test 300 minutes. Call on Monday, February 24th, 2020. My mom is going to the location of the emergency. I'm going to go to the right court, a private break. 4748 was the three names. Brands, that's R-A-N-C-D. And the pocket number, 30. I think the police don't have My voice is dead. Okay, then the last of the five points is not take up. Okay, I'll only work with that. 42 year old man. Alright. 
Okay, we're 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 taking a look at something around here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 okay. Uh,
Yes, sir. You may call your next witness. Sir, good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Thank you, sir. You may be seated. Mr. Capture, you may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Tell us, what, what do you do for a living? I was, I'm a maintenance supervisor for apartment complexes. Um, is that what your position was back on in February of 2020? Yes, it was. And what apartment complex? Tealwood Park Apartments. And um, how long did you work for Tealwood Park Apartments? About two years. And tell us, what were some of your duties um, in your position there with Tealwood Park? Daily, I cleaned the grounds, walk the property, answered maintenance calls, did emergencies, dealt with vendors. Uh, did you become familiar with the residents there at the apartment complex? Yes. Did you have occasion to uh, meet the defendant in this case and also a George Torres? Yes. Let me turn your attention to February 24th of 2020. Do you recall that date? Yes. And on that date, did you have occasion to come in contact with the defendant in this case? Yes, I did. And tell us, what was the circumstances in which you came into contact with her on February 24th? I was called by the manager, business manager, to come to, to come to her unit. I believe she was already sitting outside. And when she was sitting outside of her unit, what, if anything, did you observe uh, about her and about the unit? The police was there, her ex husband was present. She was sitting outside, and and that's when she decided she wanted to talk to me and the manager. And what did she tell you? That she's confused. She's not exactly sure what happened. Um, she pointed out that she recalls that they were playing a game of hide and seek. They were instance, she's going to teach him a lesson, and then she just doesn't recall anything else. So the next one. 
she say she fell asleep? Yes, she did. She say things got out of hand? I don't really recall that part, but I do recall her stating that they were playing their game and that George um, went into a suitcase. And I didn't, I didn't ask any questions. I just heard her talk for her. How long was this conversation? About four or five minutes. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Any cross examination? Yes, sir. You may inquire, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This conversation that uh, you had with Miss Boone, yes, that took place on the twenty fourth. Is that correct? Yeah. And who else was present at the time that the conversation was taking place? Standing right next to me would have been Melissa Sexton and Eugene Harris, as well as the officer who was in front of the door. So there was a law enforcement officer there that day, is that correct? Yes. Now, on the 24th, is when you said that Miss Boone made this statement. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, they were playing hide and seek? Yes. And what else did she say? She, she had told me they were playing hide and seek. They had drank. Um, she was trying to teach him a lesson. And that was that. She went upstairs. She went to sleep. She woke up. She doesn't know what happened. So that was on the 24th. Yes. All right. On the 26th, uh, where... Were you not interviewed by law enforcement? Yes. Okay. So I, may have my, I may have my days wrong, but it all happened on the same day. All right. 24th, do you remember two days later that a detective, Scott Lowman, conducted an interview with you at 4704 Lucia Court, when it parked for you? Do you remember that interview? Yes. So that was two days later, is that correct? I would assume so. Yes. All right. So, when he interviewed you two days later, did you tell him about this statement that Miss Boone made to you that you just told this jury in court? I did mention it to him. You did mention it to him? I mentioned to them that we did a conversation. Did you tell him the content of the conversation? I may not have told him the full content, but I did tell him we had a conversation. All right. Well, what did you tell him? What content did you tell him on the 26th? That they were playing hide and seek. That she was confused. She doesn't know what happened. I believe I did mention to him that she was trying to teach him another. Not that anything was done with malice. I didn't say that at all. So... It's your recollection now today that on the 26th, you told Officer Lowman what you just told this jury. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, sir, <clears throat> in preparing for this case, did you have a meeting with the Assistant State Attorney on September 23rd, 2024? Did I have a meeting? Yes. A brief chit chat over the phone. Brief chit chat over the phone? Yes, sir. All right. At that point in time over the phone, did you tell him Did you tell him that Sarah Boone, the defendant, stated that she was teaching him a lesson and, and things got out of hand? And that she fell asleep. Yes. Is that what you told him? Yes. Okay. And that was in 2024 of September the 23rd of this year. 20. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Are you telling us that back on February the 26th of 2020, you told Officer Lowen at that time 
the same thing. Yeah, very well, yes. So did she ever tell you how things got out of hand? No. Sir, uh, you testified that you knew both um, Mr. Torres and Ms. Broom, is that correct? Yes. Uh, you actually knew George Torres um, from a different time, didn't you? Yes, I did. When did you first know George Torres? In the 1990s. He was a teenager, and he lived down the street from me and my wife. So you had had a previous relationship with Mr. Torres? No, not at all. Not at all. You just knew him from then? That's as I stated. He was a teenager, and I was an adult. So in this time, though, that you became reacquainted with him, uh, did y'all uh, establish a friendship? At that time, here in Orlando, I wouldn't say a friendship, but an acquaintance. Yes. Sir, on Monday, February the 24th, that would have been the day that you were with uh, Miss Sexton and Gene Harris. Yes. Out in front of the apartment. Correct. Did you talk to law enforcement that day? No. You did not talk to them that day. <clears throat> I'm talking to them. Thank you, sir. I don't have any. Uh, if I can confirm, you can, sir. Thank you, sir. I don't have any further questions. Any redirect examination? Just brief. All right. Thank you. Back in the 90s, uh, when you had previously uh, known uh, George Torres, in this case, where were you living at that time? I lived across the street. I lived on one block. He lived the next block over down. In what city? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, uh, when did you move from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? 2018. So in the intervening years um, from your move from Philadelphia uh, to coming to work at Tealwood Park, did you have any contact with, uh, with, with George Torres? No. As a matter of fact, from that particular block in 2005, so I don't meet Judge again until I work at Teal Woods. Which, when did you start working at Teal Woods? AT. T. There. No further questions. Can this witness be released? No, you All right, sir. You'll be released subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you. State, call your next witness. State, we'll call Deputy Kayla Rodriguez. Good afternoon, ma'am. You can be seated. Please state your name and spell it for the record if you could for us. Kayla Rodriguez. Kayla, K A Y L A. Rodriguez, R O D R I G U E Z. Thank you. Catch door, you may inquire. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi. Can you tell us who is, <clears throat> did you work for? Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Deputy Sheriff. And how long have you been a deputy? A little over eight years since 2016. And tell us, what are your duties as a deputy sheriff? As a deputy, I respond to calls for service, anything from a overwith call, like a car being keyed, a fire, or a 911 emergency. 
And what type of training do you need to be a deputy sheriff? So for me, I obtained my bachelor's degree from UCF in criminal justice in 2014. After that, in 2016, I was hired by the sheriff's office. Um, right after um, being hired, I went straight into the academy. The academy is five months of training. We go over everything from case law, um, scenarios, defensive tactics, uh, physical training. After that, I do two more months with the sheriff's office where we go specifically into policy related to Orange County specifically. After that, I do three months on the road with a trainer. We are evaluated periodically through that process. We have a partner. You respond to calls for service during that time, and you slowly learn how to handle calls by yourself. Do you also um, undergo continuing training as a condition of your employment? Yes. Tell us, what were, were you working on February 24th, 2020? Yes. And um, tell us, what area of the county were you working in? Orange County, unincorporated Orange County. And uh, did you receive a call in regards to this case? Yes. And what was that call? What, what information did you have at the time? So the dispatcher informed me that a woman called 911. She was actively performing CPR and that her boyfriend was in a suitcase. And did you respond out to the scene? Yes. And when you responded out to the scene, were you dressed uh, similarly as you are dressed today? Yes. And uh, just for the record, you have, uh, it looks like a standard uh, green uniform on with a tool belt, uh, your, your firearm, and also radio, body-worn camera, badge. Yes. Tell us about your body-worn so my body camera is used to capture scenes when we arrive. So as we are conducting any sort of law enforcement action, we turn our camera on. When you turn your camera on, um, tell us, is there immediate, does it immediately capture uh, sound? Uh, it does not. When we activate our camera, it goes back a minute. And the minute that it goes back to, you don't hear any audio for that first minute. Um, tell us also uh, about the uh, capacity in the battery life of the camera as well. So the battery will last us an entire shift typically if it's in a buffering mode. So if we're not recording, it will last the entire shift. As we record, it does drain the battery. So typically we will turn it off if we're sitting in our car for an extended period of time. If we call our supervisor, if we're talking to another deputy on the side, away from the scene, we will not have the camera recording. If it recorded throughout the entire shift, the battery would die. We would need multiple batteries. So you actually activate uh, the camera in order to begin recording? Correct. Uh, was your body camera op or operational uh, on this call out? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness which was previously marked for identification as states H, I, and G that have been shown to defense? You may. Okay, I'm first showing you what's been marked for identification as states I. Uh, do you recognize that disc? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to review that disc prior to coming to court? Yes. And tell us, what is that disc? Body worn camera from the day of the incident. From February 24th, 2020? Correct. And is that your initials on the disc? Yes. And does that disc fairly and accurately represent um, the contents of your body worn camera? Yes. All right, this time I'd like to move to previously marked by designation the state's eye into evidence. Any objections? Okay. 
what was pre-marked as I will be received into evidence without objection to state's approval. Okay. Yeah, next I'm showing you has been marked for identification as states H. <coughs> take a look at that this. Tell us, what is that news? Body worn camera from the day of the incident. From February 24, 2020? Yes. And did you have an opportunity to review that disc prior to the report? Yes. And is that your initial on the disc? Yes. And does that disc fairly and accurately represent um, the contents of that portion of the body worn camera? Yes. Throughout this time, I'd like to do more presentation to state H in the evidence. No objection to any of those comments. What was pre marked as states H will be received without objection as states five. And lastly, ma'am, I'm showing you some more for identification at stage G. Do you recognize this disc? Yes. So tell us, what is that disc? Body worn camera from the day of the incident. So February 24, 2020? Yes. And you've had an opportunity to review this uh, camera prior to coming to court? Yes. And that true initials on the disc? Yes. And fairly and accurately represents um, your conduct on the wide board camera? Yes. Your Honor, this time I'd like to move to the board of identification of states G in the evidence. No objection. Thank you. What was pre marked as states G will be received without objection as states 6. Your Honor, uh, request permission to publish states four. You may. Your Honor, uh, maybe we did the license to review the overhead record. Yes. Okay, so 
Your Honor, uh, request permission to publish states five. You may proceed.
Your Honor, request permission to publish state six. You may do so. Sarah, you get enough water? No, if you want to stay free, you don't, I want to be alive. Some of us are going to be coming out from you and go from there. You know what I'm saying? They're here, they're going to have to be touched and then they go from there, okay? Alright. Great, you're ready to show me. My partner's gone. Um, Sarah, you're saving you a second? Alright, is it just you? Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but you guys are restored and then your son can live with you or there's to be good. Okay. Um, so from what I um, you like to get to talk to me, um, she explained um, last night that you guys were drinking a bottle of wine. Um, and around midnight, um, you decided to go to the yeah. Okay. You guys decided to play hide and seek. Oh, we were playing hide and seek. And then, <laughs> was your son home at the time? Or? Okay. No, it was fine. It was fine. Okay. Uh, started to play, just do it like that. Like, shit, we worked this time together, and we were doing the hard work. You see, the person left me that is there, and then the hard work, and then, I don't want to stand up for 
While you were at the scene, did you also make contact with Ryan Boone? Yes. Did you take a statement from him as well? I did. Were all of your interactions with the defendant on that day captured on your body worn camera? Yes. I have uh, no additional questions. Thank you. Any cross examination? No questions, sir. Is this witness released? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You're released, not subject to recall, ma'am. Thank you. Can the parties approach for a moment? All right, members of our journey, it is 321 at this time. We're going to go ahead and take that afternoon regularly scheduled break. Um, I'm going to ask you to come back here in 15 minutes at 337. Similar instructions that I've given you previously, please don't conduct any independent investigation or research as the person, places, things, or charge involved. 
and do not have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else. I thank you for your service, and we'll see you shortly. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. Bless you. State anything else we need to address? There we go. Defense. All right. We'll be in a recess till 337. Thank you very much.
We are back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603. State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances from the state. Dave on behalf of the state. William J. from the state. Defense? County Henderson for Sarah Boone. Never met of the actor. All right. Ms. Boone is still seated at council's table wearing the same black suit and pink blouse from this morning. Uh, State, anything we need to address before we bring back in our pin? Nothing to say. Defense. All right. Let's go ahead and stand and we can bring back in our panel. You may be seated. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. Members of the jury, again, if you could please raise your hand, showing that you comply with the court's instructions during our last break. The record reflect all jurors have raised their hands. State, you may call your next witness. State, we'll call Deputy John Martinez. Sir, good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record, please? Thanks, sir. You may be seated. Thank you. You may inquire, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, tell us, who is it that you work for? Orange County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Deputy Sheriff. How long have you been with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? I'm going on my 16 year. Prior to working for the Orange County Sheriff's Office, do you have any uh, previous law enforcement experience? I do. Where was that? I first started my career with the New York City Police Department. And how long were you with the New York City Police Department? About 10 years. And what was your position with the New York City Police Department? I was a police officer. And uh, at the sheriff's office, um, tell us, uh, what are some of your duties as a deputy? Uh, respond to calls, service. Um, my, now, my primary function is the uh, school resource officer. And uh, is continuing training a condition of your employment with the sheriff's office? It is. Tell us, how is it that you became involved in this case? I was uh, dispatched to this location. And what was this location? Uh, it was located at 4748 France Lane, apartment number three. And is that here in uh, Orange County, Florida? It is. And when you uh, responded to that location, uh, who did you first come into contact with? I came in contact with uh, Miss Sarah Boone. Do you see Sarah Boone here in court today? I do. Could you please point to her and identify her in the clothing she wears? Uh, the lady sitting in the middle with the black blazer. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witnesses identify the defendant? The record will still reflect.
during the time that you uh, uh, were on the scene, did you have a body worn camera? I did. And was that body worn camera activated? It was. Um, were all your uh, contacts with Miss Boone uh, recorded on that body worn camera? It was. Uh, were other deputies also on the scene at that time? Yes. And uh, was Deputy Rodriguez there? She was. So would both of your body-worn cameras uh, both capture some of the um, the, the same time frames? Uh, correct, yes. Did you have an occasion to go inside of the apartment? I did. And inside of the apartment, what observations did you make? Uh, when I first entered the apartment, I noticed a uh, Hispanic male laying on his back and looks like a small nook dining area. Um, later identified Mr. George Torres. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who's been previously marked for identification as states A and been shown to the defense? You may. Sir, I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as states K. Do you recognize that disc? I do. Tell us, what is that disc? It's a copy of my body worn camera. And does this body worn camera fairly and accurately depict the uh, portion of the events? On February 24, 2020. It does. And are those your additionals on the desk? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification of States K into evidence. Any objections? No objections. What was pre marked as States K will be received into evidence without objection, State 7. Your Honor, request permission to publish. You may. Of course, you do. Thank you. 
Any cross examination? No, sir. Can this witness be released? Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you, sir. You're released, not subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> State, you may call your next witness. State, you call Melissa Brockhart. <laughs> Ma'am, good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record for us? Melissa Ruffgarden, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-R-O-U-G-H-G-A-R-D-E-N. Thank you. Counselor, you may inquire. Ma'am, who do you work for? I'm employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. What is your position if you want to manage your Currently, I am a forensic biologist with the forensics unit. Prior to this, I was a crime scene investigator for five years. And uh, how long in total have you been with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? About six and a half years. And tell us all the positions you've held. Those two, a crime scene investigator um, and a forensic biologist. Let's turn to your work as a crime scene investigator. Uh, what does a crime scene investigator do? We respond to crime scenes. We photograph and document those crime scenes through photographs, notes, and um, sometimes sketches. We collect evidence, we process the scene, and then we do further processing to the evidence back at our forensics lab. When you say process uh, evidence, process the scene, uh, can you tell us what that entails? So it, it depends on the scene and the evidence, but it includes the photographs. We also take swabs for potential DNA. We can also do testing for um, possible blood and things like that. We also process for laying fingerprints, among other things. What type of training did you need in order to become a uh, crime scene uh, investigator? 
Upon being hired with the sheriff's office um, as a CSI, I completed a 16-week training program, um, which includes uh, in-house processing as well as going out to crime scenes with uh, trained crime scene investigators to observe and then assist, as well as taking on calls um, with the, uh, crime, the trained crime scene investigator. Approximately how many crime scenes processed in your time? It, it would be hundreds. I don't, I don't know the exact amount. Were you working in this capacity as a CSI on February 24th, 2020? Yes, I was. And tell us, where did you respond out to on that day? I responded to 4748 Friends Court, Department 3. Is that in Orange County, Florida? Yes, it is. And when you responded to that scene, who did you make contact with? I made contact with the homicide detective, Chelsea Ketzel. Uh, did you receive information uh, from the detective? Yes, that it was a death investigation. Did you walk the scene with the detective? Yes. And tell us, what does it mean to walk the scene uh, with the detective in the homicide? We go into the scene and uh, just observe. We don't interact with anything and discuss what we see. When you walk this scene, did you see George Torres? Yes, I did. Where was he located? He was located on the floor in the living room of the apartment. Did you, uh, with the detective, identify potential items of evidence to be collected? Yes. You had mentioned previously about documenting scenes with photographs. Was that done in this case? Yes, it was. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with been marked for identification as states M and been shown to defense? May. Okay. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states M. Can you take a look at the contents of state M to yourself and tell me if you recognize the uh, the items contained within states M? Yes. Do you recognize the contents of State's M? 
Yes, I do. Tell us, what is the contents of state now? They are photographs I took on the crime scene. Do they fairly and accurately represent how that crime scene appeared February 24th, 2020? Yes, they do. Sure, at this time, I'd like to move what was previously been marked for identification the state's end into evidence. How many photographs are there? We have a total of No objection. Right. What was pre marked as states M will be received into evidence without objection as states 8. Your Honor, request permission to publish. You may. And I'm first going to publish part of the state's M picture. Photo number four. Tell us, what is this? This is the front door to the residence. This is also the front door of the residence, just a closer image to the door. When you enter the residence, what is the first area uh, just off to the right? That would be the kitchen. Showing you the more the states on the left. Yes, so the, this is just inside the door. Uh, to the right, there is the, the kitchen area. So this is the uh, counter with the sink in the kitchen, and there's also the open area just above where you can see into the living room. Showing you uh, the state's composite photo 19. Yes. Oh, what is it? This is a hutch inside the kitchen. You can see in the background that is where um, that first photo of the kitchen was taken. So that's the entryway. And then this is the hutch, and there is a cell phone um, on the hutch in the kitchen. Showing you state twenty two. 
This is the trash can in the kitchen. You can also see the hutch we were just looking at there on the side. States 23. This is the contents of the trash can. You can see two wine bottles on the top of the trash. Did you also find receipts in that trash can as well? Yes. Photo 25. These are those same wine bottles and three uh, Publix receipts that were removed from the trash can. Did you take these items and collect them into evidence? Yes, I did. Photo 32 from the composite. Yes, this is just in further into that entryway. Um, you can see the living room. Photo 35 from the composite. This is another photo of the living room. You can see the victim located on the floor and a suitcase in the bottom corner of the photograph. Photo 36. This is another photograph in the living room. This is that wall we saw in the kitchen there, the opening. Um, you can also see a wooden baseball bat leaning against the wall. Was that baseball bat collected in the evidence in this case? Yes, it was. Photo 38. This is <clears throat> excuse me. This is also a photograph of the living room. Um, just the other other side of the room. Photo 43 from the deposit. Yes. This photograph was taken in the living room. You can see the stairs leading to the second floor. Photograph 45. This is a photograph of the living room just from the other side of the room. You can see the front door in the middle back of the photo. Photo. This is a more close up photograph of the suitcase. Photo 50. This is a photograph of one of the uh, zippers on the suitcase.
photograph 51. This is a close-up um, picture of that same zipper. There is no um, zipper pole on it. It appears to be a small wire of some sort, the pink wrapped around the zipper. This is the zipper on the other side of the suitcase. The close up image of that same zipper. There's also no zipper pull on that one. This is the contents of the suitcase after just lifting the lid. Photo 56 from the deposit. More of a close up image of the items. Um, there were miscellaneous. Papers and paperwork, some clothing items, and um, apparent blood inside the suitcase. What items, uh, what apparent blood was inside the suitcase? Um, you could, it was observed on the white cap and a necktie, and there was also visible blood just um, on the interior of the suitcase. Photo 57 from the composite. Um, the contents of the suitcase, but you can see the white, cla white cap more clearly and the uh, blood observed on it. Fifty-eight from the composite. You can see the necktie with blood. It, it, it appeared to be silver multicolored. And then there's also a uh, diazepam syringe in the plastic uh, casing there. It was prescribed to the victim. Oh, the 61 from the department. That is the miscellaneous papers and paperwork that was removed from the suitcase. Oh, the 62 from the compartment. That's the suitcase after all of the items were removed. Photo 64 from the compartment. Yes, that is, um, it appeared to be some, like, small pieces of paper um, that appeared to be soaked with blood. Is this inside of the suitcase? Yes. Photo 65 from the compartment. <coughs> That is the baseball bat that was leaning against the wall in the living room. Photo 68 from the compartment. This is back to the stairs to the second floor in the living room. Photo 69 from the deposit. Moving closer to the stairs to the second floor. Photo 70 from the deposit. Photographing um, more of the staircase.
these are the steps leading to the second floor before I proceed up to the second floor. Photo 71. Photo 72 from the compiler. <coughs> the upper portion of the stairs leading to the second floor. How many bedrooms were on the second floor with you? There were two bedrooms. Photo 75 from the composite. This is the hallway. You can see a closet in the hallway and then the door to one of the bedrooms. Did this appear to be a child's room? Yes, it did. Photo 79 from the composite. This is a photograph within the child's bedroom. Photo eighty six of the composite. This is the door leading to the other bedroom upstairs. Did this other bedroom also contain a bathroom? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Oh, the 90 from the composite? This is the bed within that bedroom. Photo 97 from the composite. This is the uh, bathroom. In that master bedroom upstairs? Yes. Did you also have an occasion photograph the defendant? Yes, I did. See the defendant here in court today? Yes, I do. Can you please point to them and identify our number of clothing room. She is right there with a black blazer and a pink shirt. Your Honor, may the record reflect that witnesses identified the defendant. Record so reflect. Showing you photo 98 from the composite. This is the photograph I took of the defendant. Why is it that you were photographing the defendant? I collected uh, her buckle swabs, which is a DNA standard from the inside of the mouth, and it is part of our procedure to photograph um, that person for identification purposes. You also document the rest of her body as well. Yes, I did. Publishing photograph 101 This is a photograph of her hands facing upward. Photograph 102. This is her right hand facing upward. Photograph 103. 
her left hand facing upward. Photograph 104. Both of her hands facing downwards to the tops of her hands. Photograph 105. This is her right hand facing downward. Photograph 106. And her left hand facing downward. <clears throat> Photograph 107. This would be of her right arm. Photograph 108. Her left arm. Photograph 109. Her right arm with it facing upward. Photograph. One her left arm with her arm facing upward. During the time you were interacting with the defendant, did she ever indicate to you that she had any injuries? No. You had previously testified that you also collected physical items of evidence from the home as well. Yes, I did. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with the mark for identification as state C and then show the defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm assuming it was remarked for identification as state C. Can you take a look at that back for me? Yes. Do you recognize that package? Yes, I do. And tell us, what is that package? These are the two wine bottles that were collected from the trash can. Is your name on that package? Yes, my name is on the Orange County Sheriff's Office evidence label that I filled out. And my initials are on the evidence seal when I sealed the package. And it also has your agency case number and uh, location of the bank. Yes, that is correct. And could you open the contents of State C and look at it to your thumb? <laughs> Pull them out. Recognize the item. They're wrapped in them. Sure. How did you from the
What is the content of Seed City? These are the two wine bottles that I collected from the trash can. Do the, are these wine bottles in the same or substantially the same condition as they were at the time that you packaged them on February 24th, 2020? Yes, the same time I collected them that day. Your Honor, this time I'd like to move this previously been marked for identification in this case C evidence. Any objections? What was pre marked in state C will be received into evidence as states nine without objection. Then your Honor, request permission to publish. You may do so. Did you also have occasion to collect the baseball bat for the living room? Yes, I did. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been previously marked for identification as states B and show the defense? You may. Okay, I'm showing you who has been marked for identification as states B. Can you take a look at this item? Yes. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. This is the wooden baseball bat I collected from the living room. Does this item have your name on it? Yes, it has my name on the Orange County Sheriff's Office evidence label that I filled out, as well as my initials on the evidence seal. It also has uh, your initials and your agency case number as well. Yes, it does. Ma'am, could you open the states B and look at the contents of it uh, to yourself now that it is going to the court? Yes. What is contained within stage B? The wooden baseball bat. And is that bat in the same or substantially the same condition as it was at the time that you collected it on February 24th? Yes, it is. Your Honor, this time I'd like to move the previous decision mark for identification as stage B into evidence. Any objection? No objection. What was pre marked as B will be received into evidence as states 10 without objection.
Your Honor, request permission to publish. You may. You also had an occasion to collect the suitcase as well in this case. Yes, I did. Prior to placing the suitcase into evidence, uh, did you process it? I took measurements of the suitcase. What are the measurements of the suitcase? It was 28 inches in length, 20 inches wide, and 8 and 7 eighths inches deep. Your Honor, at this time, you may the witness step down from the stand in a close and close area. Yes. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states A. Tell me, do you recognize this item? Oh, what is this item? This is the suitcase I collected from the living room. And how is it that you know that this is a suitcase you collected from the living room? It has the March County Sheriff's Office evidence label that I labeled with the edit description. It also contains my name and the agent's case number. And my initials are also on the evidence. Ma'am, at this time, could you open states A and look at the contents of it to your point? What is inside of State's A? This is the suitcase I've left in front of the It has appeared to be in the same or substantially the same condition uh, as the time that you collected it and placed it into evidence? Yes. Your at this time I'd like to move the mark for identification is State A into evidence. Any objections? No objection. What was pre marked as A will be received into evidence without objection as State's 11. And Your Honor, at this time I ask for permission to publish State's A to the jury. You may. <laughs> Can you go over the inside of it?
How easy is it to operate the zipper? It was a little difficult. I have no additional questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross examination? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you also referred to as a medical examiner investigator as opposed to just crime scene investigator? No, that is not my title. Do you do reports that the front of the medical examiner necessarily relies upon in the process of doing the autopsy and additional um, investigations? You would have to ask them. Who makes the decision at the scene as to what items will be photographed and what items will be taken to test and what items are necessary to test for an analog. That's a collaborative effort between the crime scene investigator and the lead detective uh, while on scene. Uh, who was the lead detective? The lead detective was Chelsea Kepsel. Now, you authored a report in this matter, did you not? Yes. And that report uh, was utilized, if you in fact mm-hmm. know, by the medical examiner in developing her autopsy report, was it not? I do not know. In your report, did you advise the medical, whomever might read your report, that in fact the body had been removed from the suitcase by first defenders or first responders? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. And we know that you have the capacity to do DNA analysis, correct? Uh, no, we process DNA and uh, collect swaps for DNA, and then that's submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for conventional DNA analysis. You did that sample from the inside of Sarah Boone's mouth. Her buckle swabs were submitted to the FDLE. And who made that decision? Uh, the detective and I. Who made the decision not to bother to do a DNA analysis on blood? Uh, from the item in the suitcase or the suitcase itself. That was a discussion between the detective and I. And you chose not to do that? No, we did not. You assumed the blood inside the suitcase belonged to George or as correct? There was blood observed in the suitcase. But you don't know who that belonged to because you didn't bother to analyze it or have it analyzed, correct? The blood was not tested. Now, uh, State's Exhibit B, the back. Uh, you took that into evidence. Was that, again, a collaborative uh, decision by yourself and the lead detective? Yes. And what efforts did you make to have the fat analyzed, uh, given the fact that it was apparently evidence? It was just collected as evidence from the scene. Did you advise either the lead detective uh, or anybody else involved with this investigation that there may be matters that could be analyzed or analyzing that that would help or assist in the investigation of this matter? It's my job to do the documentation and the collection of evidence. You sort of collaborative effort in itself with the detective, so did you participate in that decision? We chose to collect the bat and put it into evidence. So there was a fiber analysis done on the bat to determine whether or not it was used to strike George Torres when he was in the suitcase. Was there not? Uh, pardon? In fact, it was not, was it? There was no effort to analyze the bat. Sustain. Please. Can you repeat the question? Uh, if I can remember it, I Do you know that there was any effort made in this particular investigation? investigation of Sarah Boone to analyze the bat for fibers. No, there was not. And why was that not done? It, it, it was not done. You indicated that you had some interaction with Ms. Boone, is that correct? I collected her buckle swabs. Speak with her? Uh, in collecting her buckle swabs, yes. Did you speak to any other witnesses? No. Did you make any determination of other matters that might be uh, of import or evidentiary, evidentiary value when you were going through the house and taking photographs, 
and documenting the interior of the townhouse. You'll have to be more specific. Well, how many pictures of the child bedroom did we see? Here today, we saw the entrance to the bedroom as well as a photograph of the interior of the bedroom. What was the evidentiary value of that? It's my job to photograph and document while on scene, so the rooms in the upstairs were photographed and documented. Did you photograph holes in the wall, possibly made by the victim? I don't recall photographing holes in the wall now. Did you take photographs of items with in the house or throughout the house that may have depicted incidents of fire violence? Um, you'll have to be more specific. How about bloody pillowcases? Did you make any effort to collect and analyze pillowcases of the rooms that you were photographing? No. Who made you have significant experience with zippers? I use zippers regularly, yes. Enough to have an, an opinion as to whether or not a zipper is stupid or not. Is what? Sorry? You just made, testified on direct that the zipper was a little tight. Just that it was difficult without the zipper pulls to use the zipper? Uh, yes, from opening the suitcase here today. Okay. You only tested it today? Pardon? You only today have for the first time tested the ability to pull open the zipper? On the suitcase? No, I'm saying it was difficult today. A redirect examination. Yes, Your Honor. In this case, um, you documented uh, the, the entirety of the house, as you saw. Yes. So every room in the house. They were all um, taken overall photographs. Walls in the house? In, in the overall photographs, yes. They weren't all individually photographed, no. And you did not document or note any type of holes in the wall or any type of damage to the walls, anything like that? Not the walls, no. Is that something that would have been documented both photographically and also within your book? Yes. You also, as we've previously seen in the composite, saw the victim where he was laying in this case, correct? Yes. Was the victim, did he have blood on his mouth and on his face? Yes, he did. Did he have open wounds on his body? There was blood coming from his nose and his mouth. There was also some other uh, areas of uh, like defects noted on his body. You also made contact with the defendant, too, as well. Yes. Did you know any other wounds or cuts or anything else that was not documented in the testimony? No. So, no wounds, nothing on it? Not that I recall, no. No further questions. Thank you. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Ross, can this witness be released? Judge, we'd like her to be on call. Subject to recall, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Can the parties approach?
Members of the jury, thank you so much for your attention in this matter. It is 4.52. At this time, we're going to go ahead and take our recess for the evening. Um, Madam Clerk has letters that I have signed regarding your jury service for you to provide to your employer. The court deputy will provide them to you in the deliberation room before you are released for the day. I have similar instructions to read to you that I gave you before the lunch hour. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors, do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face-to-face, -face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, blog. With that, members of the jury, I'm going to release you back to the deliberation room for you to receive the paperwork for your employer. We will see you at 9 a.m. this coming Monday, October 21st. I thank you for your sacrifice and your service. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. State, anything else we need to discuss? Not for the state. Defense. All right. Thank you all very much. We will see you at 9 a.m. Monday, October 21. We're off the record.